Well, thank you very much, uh, Mizan, for that introduction, very generous introduction. I hope I can live up to it and <laughs> be billed in this way. Um, it's always a, a bit of a challenge. Um, and I'm yeah. going to be, I'll, I'll talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a, a 15 minutes for question and answer and then a break. And then, well, that's the, that's the pattern we'll go on uh, through today. I've um, left up on the table here, which I'll just leave out during the break, copies of three of my books, which are available in paperback. This isn't a sales talk. Um, I'm not, I don't have copies to, to, to sell or anything. It's just so that if those of you are interested, get some idea what I've been writing and, 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 and the approach I take. Uh, one of them, I should come. The, uh, uh, the Prophet and the Age of the Caliphs, uh, Caliphates is a sort of really a history textbook for aimed at students uh, of Islamic history and so on. The other two books, uh, The Great Arab Conquest, which is about what it says it's about. It's about the great expansion of Islam in, 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 the, century, in the century or so after the death of the Prophet. Um, and the second one, The Courts of the Caliphs, which is about court and society in Abbasid Baghdad and Samarra and so on. It focuses on the Abbasid period, so it's not really an Umayyad period book. But these two are aimed at a, 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 at a more general audience and they've been published, as you see, in paperback. Both of them, which I'm very, very pleased about, have been translated into Arabic, but they've also been translated into a number of other uh, uh, European and Asian languages. So that's what I do, basically. And I've come to talk to you today about the Umayyads. And the question I really want to start off with is, why should we bother with the Umayyads, put it that way? The caliphs of the Islamic world from 661 to 750. And I think the Umayyad period is, 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 though it seems far away and very remote, is at the same time extremely important in our understanding of the formation of the Islamic world and, and Islamic society. It's also controversial. And it's controversial because there are really two ways of, broadly speaking, two ways of looking at the Umayyads. The first of them uh, is a, an, an attitude taken by uh, many scholars from all over the world and sees the Umayyad period as a period when Islamic rule becomes established, uh, when the foundations of um, Islamic government are uh, laid down, uh, institutions appear, the institution of the Qadi, the institution of the Shorta and so on. I, idea, uh, institutions appear at this time which have a very, very long life. And we can see uh, the Umayyads as establishers of a state, they are also the caliphs under whom the second great phase of conquest takes place, the great phase of Islamic conquest that takes Muslim rule to Spain and the Maghreb on the one hand and to um, what we call what's Central Asia, to Uzbekistan and, and, uh, and Turkmenistan on the other hand and also to Sindh, the southern part of uh, Pakistan of course. So we've got the Umayyads as, as leaders of the conqueror, conquering armies or directors, I think, because they don't actually lead them in person, directors of the conquering armies on one hand and uh, for founders of the Islamic State on the other. But then there is a, another argument um, held by uh, many Muslims and some of them um, that sees the Umayyad caliph, uh, caliphate as essentially illegitimate. And of course, amongst the Shia, this would be the, the dominant narrative and amongst other Muslims too. Uh, this is an uh, idea that is particularly generated in the post-Umayyad period under Abbasids, and of course the, uh, certain people, at least in the Abbasid Caliphate, were, were concerned to emphasize the legitimacy of the Abbasids and the illegitimacy of the Umayyads. The argument being simply that the Umayyad family were, until at least the last two years of the Prophet's life, long-standing opponents of the Prophet. Um, Abu Sufyan, the father of the first of the Umayyad Caliphs, was uh, uh, the father of the first of the Umayyad Caliphs was, of course, amongst the leading opponents of the Prophet in uh, Mecca and uh, subsequently one of the leaders of the, of the um, resistance of Quraysh to the Prophet. And then uh, the seizure of power, if you like, by the Umayyads can be seen as 
a coup d'etat, if you like, an illegitimate coup d'etat, and that the real, uh, that they were in a sense unpious, impious, or they were even, um, and it's not until they were overthrown that a, a truly Islamic uh, approach to politics can be seen at the highest level. So we've got these two very contrasting points of view about them. And that, I think, is, uh, and that raises the whole issue of legitimacy in Islamic government, of course, the first time, who, this is the fundamental debating point that goes on in the first century of Islam or the first two centuries of Islam, is who should be the rulers? Uh, it's a debate about who should have authority within the community and what this authority should mean. So I want to start off therefore by talking about these institutions of legitimacy and how is it that the uh, Umayyads uh, became the rulers of the Islamic community even though they were not of the family of the Prophet, even though they were not uh, early converts to Islam. What's going on here? Well, um, we have to remember after the death of uh, of the Prophet, there is very early on discussions, even disputes in the Muslim Ummah about who should uh, provide the leadership. And from a very beginning, as far as we can tell, there were people who certainly felt that the family of the Prophet, uh, represented by uh, Fatima, his daughter, and of course uh, Ali, her husband, were in a sense the, uh, should be considered the legitimate rulers of the of leaders of the Muslim community. But there was also another point of view, of course, that the, the leaders of the Muslim community should not be necessarily be of the family of the Prophet, but should rather be people who were chosen by the community as the most, the wisest, the most pious, the most um, uh, satisfactory leaders, and the people who are most likely to continue, though not as prophets, nonetheless, as it were, the political and military dimensions of, of, of the Prophet's achievement. And these people elected or, or chose um, uh, Abu Bakr and then Umar ibn al-Khattab, and the, the names of these people are on, on, your, on, your, on your fact sheet here, as the leaders of the community. So in a sense, there is a distinction here between divine choice of the ruler as represented by the family of the prophet, whose authority comes from God by virtue of their being family of the prophet, and uh, the other which, point of view, which we might call proto-Sunni, though these distinctions emerge quite slowly in the Islamic community, um, just in, in, in brackets, I don't think it's really till the 10th century uh, common era, um, a third Islamic century, that we can start talking about Sunnis and Shi'is as distinct groups. I think before then there are a lot of flexible ideas, a sort of continuum of, of, of different ideas uh, going around. But these, these people um, believe, in a sense, that the, Muslims, uh, that the Muslim community should elect and choose in one form or another, whether it's represented by uh, a sort of nas, a sort of designation, or whether it's represented by the sort of shura that we have uh, uh, in the period of the Rashidun, that the Muslims should choose their rule. Um, the rise of the Umayyads might seem uh, improbable. But there are two things that were going for the Umayyads, uh, the Umayyad family. The first uh, was that while they had for many years um, uh, opposed, or particularly the older generation represented by Abu Sufyan, had opposed the teaching of the Prophet and the activities of the Prophet, his uh, sons certainly became Muslims, and Muawiyah, the first of the Umayyad caliphs, seems to uh, begin his career as one of the uh, prophet secretaries. So though um, they uh, had, as it were, made a bad, bad start in Islam, nonetheless, uh, Muawiyah was a member of the Sahaba, uh, a young member for sure, but he was one of the companions of the prophet. Nobody could dispute that. And secondly, he was a member of Quraysh. Now, Apart from the Khawarij, the Kharijites in the early Islamic period, who I'm not going to spend a lot of time today, all early Muslims seem to have accepted that the leader of the Muslim community 
should come from Quraysh, the, fam the tribe of the Prophet, the tribe that was um, they were managing the Haram in, in Mecca in pre-Islamic times. Now Quraysh included not just the family of the Prophet himself, Ali and Fatima Quraysh also uh, included the Umayyad family. So they had that sort of legitimacy uh, to go for. But they also had um, a, a realistic power base, by which I mean well, that uh, we are told, with every reason to believe, that, that in the pre-Islamic times, even in the, um, uh, in the, or in the early years of Islam, that the Umayyad family had property. They had landed estates in Syria, in the area that's known as the, the, the Belkar in the early Islamic sources, that's the area south of Amman in, in Jordan. Um, that uh, we don't know exactly where they were, but they owned villages and agricultural land and so on in this area. So even before the coming of Muslim armies and so on, they had the contacts. They knew people. They had a, a certain loyalty, um, perhaps um, amongst a, a, a following there. And then in the um, time of the conquests, uh, Muawiyah, who is the first of the Umayyad caliphs, of course, um, Muawiyah's elder brother, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, was one of the main military commanders in Syria at the time of the conquests. And he was one of the four commanders who is said, for example, to have led the Muslim armies in the conquest of Damascus. So while they were not family of the Prophet and while they had become, they didn't have sabaka, or they didn't have very much sabaka. Sabaka is a key concept in this early Islamic discussions about who should be uh, the rulers of the uh, leaders of the community. Sabaka is a, can be translated into English that is precedence in Islam. Sabaka, it, the people with the most sabaka, so to speak, are the people whose whose families or whose fathers or grandfathers or grandmothers who have, have become Muslims very early on. And one of the criteria for being part of the early Muslim elite was, was this sabaka. And those whose families had become Muslims, for example, in Mecca before the Hijra, clearly had a, a high degree of sabaka. The, the Umayyads had, as it were, some sabaka. They, clearly become converted to Islam before the death of the Prophet, but they didn't have the highest rank in them. Nonetheless, they did have uh, some Islamic legitimacy. Um, and as I say, uh, both Muawiyah and his elder brother Yazid had been amongst the Sahaba, amongst the, the companions of the Prophet. And this is important because it didn't mean that they were, um, they had a certain legitimacy from that direction. But let's look in a bit more detail about what happens in the actual uh, achievement of power by the Umayyads. Uh, and we go back here to the death of the Caliph Othman, the third of the Rashidun uh, Caliphs, in of course the, the year 656. Now, the death of Othman was a, the first, if you like, major trauma of the Islamic community. Uh, for though many people um, criticized Uthman uh, for some of his actions, nonetheless, the murder of the defenseless caliph as he sat read, reading the Quran in his house in Medina was a profound shock to uh, the Muslim community, that it should have become divided and that this should have been the uh, result of it. And it's important to remember that Othman was a member of the Umayyad family. He was a cousin of the first Umayyad caliphs. He wasn't directly in the same line, but he was a, a cousin of the first Umayyad caliphs. And when he was murdered, there was clearly a question about what was going to happen next. This, um, this terrible event left the Muslim community uh, really um, trying to decide how the leadership should move on. Now, it was 
generally accepted, I think widely accepted, that the person who should succeed Uthman uh, was Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course uh, the son-in-law of, 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 of the Prophet and so on. Um, but there were problems. And the main problem with Ali's succession was the question of what should be done with the murderers of Uthman. The murderers of Uthman were well known. There wasn't any dispute about who it was. It wasn't something that happened secretly and you know, behind closed doors or anything. It was well established. And they were the Muslims among the Muslims of from Iraq and the Muslims too from uh, a lesser group from Egypt. The question was how should these people be punished? Now the problem for Ali was that the murderers of Uthman were amongst the strongest supporters of his caliphate. It was very difficult for him to move against them uh, without alienating a lot of his, his, his supporters and so on, who felt that Uthman had, you know, had deserved what was coming to him, so to speak. So, Ali's caliphate, even though there was no immediate opposition, Ali's caliphate gets off to a very bad start because there are lots of people in the Muslim community um, who feel that he should have take, be taking action against the murderers of Uthman. And yet, for political reasons, he's finding this very difficult. And um, so we get this, uh, uh, this tension from the beginning. And of course, nobody is more incensed or no, no, nobody is more angry about the murder of Uthman than the members of his family. Amongst them, these very powerful people now in Syria, leaders of the conquest, Yazid and his uh, younger brother, Muawiyah. And we can finish with Yazid at this stage because he died of the, like so many early Muslims did in Syria, in fact, he died of the plague. The, the, um, the, um, many of the uh, Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula were simply not resistant to these urban diseases that, you've, that they encountered in, in places like Damascus and so on. There was a high mortality rate. Many more early Muslims were killed by the plague than were killed in battle in, in the early years in, 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 in Syria. So the uh, Umayyad family took up the leadership of the, the, the cry for the um, revenge on, uh, for Osman. And Muawiyah made it clear, who was by this time governor of Syria, and by Syria we mean the whole of what is nowadays known as Bilad uh, from the Turkish border right down to the Red Sea and the Sinai Desert and so on, the whole of the eastern Mediterranean seaboard there, and that's the way I'll use Syria throughout. But something else was, so they were ensconced in, in Syria, Muawiyah argues that uh, he cannot acknowledge Ali until this business of the murderers of Uthman is sorted out to his satisfaction. The, um, but there is something else going on here in the early Islamic community, and that is the question of regional tensions. And this is something that uh, historians um, have, I think, curiously underestimated. But if you read the Arabic accounts, the early Muslim accounts of the confrontation, between Ali and uh, Muawiyah at the Battle of Siffin, which I'm going to, going to um, come to in a minute, at the Battle of Siffin, it's clear that regional tensions were evident from a very early stage. There is constant reference to the Ahl al-Sham and the Ahl al-Iraq. And this was to be a dominant feature in the whole of Umayyad politics. What's the issue here? Well, uh, Syria was the first focus. Uh, the Prophet himself, after all, had actually visited Syria and uh, had visited Damascus, we're told, and almost certainly correctly. Quraysh had strong links with Syria. They didn't have very many strong links with Iraq in the pre-Islamic, very early phases of Islam. And um, there's no doubt during the time of the conquest that many of the Syrian elite, many of the Quraysh elite and so on, like the, the Umayyads themselves, uh, migrated to Syria and settled in Syria and um, used the resources of Syria for their political aspirations. 
The conquest of Iraq uh, was rather different. Very few of the elite of Quraysh uh, settled in Iraq. In fact, practically none of them. Um, the conquest of Iraq was rather achieved by tribes from northeast Arabia, from the Yamama and uh, the, the, the Najba, northeast Arabia and, and Arabia more generally. And two things were important about this. The first was many more Arab Muslim tribesmen settled in Iraq than settled in Syria. As far as we can tell, clearly we don't have lists, we don't have numbers and so on and so forth. But it's in Iraq that the first uh, great cities are founded, the first great Islamic cities are founded, at Kufa, uh, now to, of course to the southwest of Baghdad, and Basra uh, down on the Gulf. And it's in these areas that large numbers of Arab Muslims are settled. Very soon after they begin the settlement of the city of Mosul, which is another Islamic new town that appears in the early Umayyad period. So you have a, a, a much larger number, perhaps, of Iraqi uh, of Muslims settled in Iraq. And the second issue was that Iraq was by far the richest part of the uh, new Islamic empire. And we can sort of tell this uh, because we have records of tax receipts or tax yields from the Umayyad and Abbasid period. And uh, these show that the Sawad of Iraq, that is the uh, alluvial lands from Baghdad down to the head of the Gulf, provided four times as much revenue to the government as the next richest province, which was Egypt, and five times as much of the whole of Syria, all the provinces of Syria put together. So though Syria was uh, the, the, the destination of the elite and an important area and, 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 and so on and so forth, nonetheless, um, the economic power, if you like, was, was in Iraq. And we get this regional rivalry between, and it runs right the way through to the end of the Umayyad period, between the Ahl al-Sham and the Ahl al-Iraq. Now, when we, when we use the word Ahl, we don't mean, of course, all the people of Syria or all the people of, 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 of Iraq. We mean the Muslim populations of these areas uh, because the um, non-Muslim population, who are certainly a majority at this stage, um, I'll talk a bit more about conversion uh, later on, but um, the majority at this stage did, politically did not count and they were not part of the discussion. Uh, they, you know, uh, their communities live different sorts of lives. So we've got this rivalry, it's a rivalry for resources. So we've got two issues here, as so often happens in, in the complicated history of human societies. We've got, a, as it were, an ideological and uh, issue here about leadership of the community, whether Ali can be leader without um, punishing the, the, the murderers of Osman and so on. And we've got a regional, more, if you, more financial, if you like, uh, rivalry going on here, and the and what happens in uh, political terms is that Ali moves from Medina, which had hitherto been the capital of the Islamic world and the seat of the Caliphate, he moves from Medina to Iraq to be with his supporters in Iraq. And what started off as a dispute about. Uh, the legitimacy of Ali and the, the murderers uh, and, and the fate of the murderers of Othman becomes a regional rivalry as well. And there is a major confrontation at the a place called Safin, which is now actually underwater with the new um, Euphrates dams, uh, it, in Syria uh, towards the borders of Iraq. And the two armies come together, the Ahl al Iraq. Uh, supporting Ali and the Ahl al-Sham supporting Muawiyah come together for a confrontation at Safin. And what exactly happened at Safin has been a subject of controversy ever since amongst uh, historians and amongst, amongst Muslims. It's clear that the, the armies faced each other. Uh, there was a certain amount of uh, skirmishing, not a really major battle, but a certain amount of fighting and so on. Uh, it was a confrontation that probably lasted several months. Um, 
before the uh, people of uh, the Ahl Sham, the people of Syria, famously raised uh, the Masachif, the, the leaves of the Quran, on their spears and demanded that there should be an arbitration, that Muslims shouldn't be fighting each other, uh, that there should be an arbitration. And the two armies parted. Now, the question then was, what was this arbitration going to be about? Was it going to be about the uh, fate of the murderers of Osman, because this, this problem still remained, or was it going to be about who was going to be the leader of the Muslim community? Uh, and the sources are quite unclear about this. Various people, different, different chronicles, different Arab writers uh, say different things. But in the end, the whole issue was rendered irrelevant, in a sense, because Ali was murdered uh, in the year 661. And murder, as far as we know, this murder had nothing to do with, with Muawiyah, though some in the Shia would, uh, would, would think that it did. It seems to have been uh, 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 the result of uh, tension or uh, a lot of personal grudges. But Ali had retreated from Safin, from this confrontation to Iraq, and there his support had um, disintegrated. There were lots of people who were not pleased by what had happened. Ali seemed to have surrendered his right to the caliphate, or at least put his right to the caliphate um, on, on, on the line, so to speak, it become a subject of dispute by his agreeing to the arbitration. And a number of, people, of his most militant supporters deserted him. And these are the people who are called Kharijites or Khawarij in the Arabic plural, uh, Kharijites. Now, Kharijites represent uh, an important uh, group within the early Islamic state. And once again, there is, as it were, an ideological background of Kharijism at this stage and a more physical, if you like, or social attitude to Kharijism. The ideological one, uh, the essence of Kharijism, was that anyone could become caliph if they were the most pious and the most suitable of the Muslims. That means there is no need for the caliph to be a member of Quraysh. And that marked them off from both the Shia and, or the proto-Shia, as you call them, and the proto-Sunnis. The second issue was that anyone who um, committed a major sin was a kafir, not just a sinner, not just a Muslim who committed a sin, but was essentially an unbeliever. And as an unbeliever and as an ex-Muslim, then they could be attacked and slaughtered and so on. So we get this idea of a, 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 a small, if you like, Puritan uh, community here with a very strong ideological basis. But it also looks as if the Kharijites were those Bedouin Arabs who didn't want to accept settlement and becoming part of the new Islamic State. The idea of Hijra is, is an idea that persists in the early Islamic period. The Hijra, of course, of the Prophet from, uh, from Mecca to Medina is, is the great Hijra. But the idea of Hijra from the desert to the towns was a very important part of being part of the Muslim community. The early caliphate encouraged and in many cases insisted on Arab Muslims of the Arabs of the desert coming and settling in Kufa and Basra and so on, becoming part, if you like, of the organization and accepting the salaries, the attar from the state, and the this year I'll come back to, and so on. But there, are certain, there were certain people, I think, for all sorts of um, quite understandable reasons, people who were very reluctant to abandon the Bedouin lifestyle to which they were used, <coughs> and very reluctant to settle in houses and towns, very reluctant to accept the obligation to, to um, pay taxes and accept the rule of, 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 of governors and things like that. And these people tended to become Khawarij. So there are at once, if you like, once again, we have an ideological framework to Khawarijism and a, um, a uh, um, social, if you like, framework to, to Khawarijism. And, and the two come together. And for the rest of, after the, confrontation of Safin until the uh, death of Ali, his main problem was with these Kharijites. 
uh, while the uh, uh, Muawiyah and the Umayyads were able to consolidate their power in uh, Syria. The Karajites, uh, of course, um, continued to be, as it were, brigands and, and so on in the Umayyad period, the early Abbasid period. But by the middle Abbasid period, by the 10th, well, 8th century common era, uh, second half of the 8th century, Karajism mutates, changes, and becomes essentially peaceful and quietist uh, sect of Islam. And there are, of course, still Karajites in, uh, or people who descend from different Karajite groups in Oman today and in parts of Algeria who trace their ideology right back to this early period, but who've long since abandoned the violence that was characteristic of early Karajism. So, um, in 661, uh, and I'm using common era dates almost all the way through here, in the year 661, uh, Ali is murdered. And what happened after that was essentially a peaceful, mostly peaceful takeover by Muawiyah of the lands of Iraq and, and, and the, the leadership of the entire Muslim community. Muawiyah has a, a reputation in the early Islamic sources uh, as being the superb politician. Even his enemies recognized his political skills. He had that virtue which the, the, the Arabic source is called Hilm, and Hilm is about skills in negotiation, about, in some cases, paying the people who need to be paid, in some cases offering them favors, in some cases simply being generous to them in, in, and, and, and welcoming them and so on. And essentially, with Ali gone, Muawiyah made agreements with the leaders of the tribes in Iraq that they would accept him as ruler. Um, in exchange, essentially, for being allowed to do what they wanted to or being allowed to be you know, effective rulers of Iraq. It was what Muawiyah was really generating was a sort of federal state, if you like, a federal state in which the people of Iraq would, the Ahlul Iraq, would essentially uh, rule Iraq, enjoy the resources of Iraq, but would accept Muawiyah as caliph. But Muawiyah would really stay in Syria and. Um, so on and so forth. Now, Ali, as, uh, as I'm sure we all know, had two sons, actually more than two sons, but two sons that are, are important for this discussion. Um, the eldest, Al Hassan, and the youngest, uh, younger, sorry, Al Hussein. Now, Al Hassan is, was, uh, and here again, the sources are in general agreement. Al Hassan was prepared to accept a quiet life. He stayed in Medina, he was paid a generous pension, and he stayed in Medina and he died in Medina without having, in any sense, attempted to realize and actualize the, uh, uh, the claim that he might have had to the caliphate. And Hussein, for the time, whole of Muawiyah's lifetime, Hussein uh, remained in um, Mecca, uh, in Medina as well. And as far as we know, had very little political role. Now, what happened uh, after the death of Muawiyah in the year 680 uh, was led to uh, and, uh, the second great trauma of the Islamic community. And um, before his death, Muawiyah had persuaded most people by a mixture of threats and bribery, essentially, that power should pass after his death to his son Yazid, and that Yazid could uh, be uh, expected to uh, inherit, if you like, the caliphate. Now, this was a problem for lots of people in the Muslim community because, firstly, it suggested that the monarchy should be hereditary, or the caliphate should be hereditary. Uh, in the family of Muawiyah. And a lot of people who were quite prepared to accept Muawiyah because of what he'd done and so on, were very reluctant to accept uh, the rule of um, 
Yazid automatically inheriting from his father. But once again, there were regional tensions as well. The people in Syria, by and large, supported Yazid because the, the Umayyads were their people. They, the, uh, but the Muslims of Iraq and the increasing numbers of Muslims in Iran uh, were very reluctant to do so because to accept Yazid would be more dominance by the Syrians. It would mean that power was going to continue to be held in Damascus, not in Kufa or Basra, and so on. So once again, we have the regional tensions and the ideological tensions. And in the aftermath of Muawiyah's death um, uh, and Yazid's accession to the throne, a group of people, a considerable number of people in Kufa, uh, as uh, probably the largest, well certainly one of the largest Arab cities in, in Iraq, wrote to Hussein suggesting that he should come to Iraq and lead what would essentially be an Iraqi movement uh, to claim the caliphate, or at least, um, and to resist the imposition of Yazid. And this is where the whole tragedy of, of, of Hussein stems from, um, because he, as, as we know, left Medina, went across the desert with a fairly small number of followers and his family. And the supporters of, uh, and the, supporters of the Umayyads in Iraq, who, who, of whom there were some, including the governor, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, we'll come back to that family later on, uh, uh, the um, Umayyad Syrian soldiers in Iraq effectively surrounded him and killed him with his family. And this was, as I say, the second great trauma of the Islamic community for the grandson of the prophet had been uh, done to death in what seemed to many people to be a heartless and, um, uh, and dreadful way with, 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 with a lot of suffering. And the death of Hussein was going to become one of the major weaknesses of the Umayyad quest for legitimacy. The killing of the grandson of the Prophet by the agents of the Umayyads meant that for many people, and obviously particularly the people in Iraq, that the uh, Umayyads could never be the legitimate rulers of the Muslim community because this was uh, a, a, a major sin. It also created a trauma in another way, of course, that the people of Kufa, who had invited and persuaded Hussein to come across the desert from Medina, to leave his comfortable home in Medina and come and fight, failed to do anything to help him and failed to rise up as they promised they would, um, or their leaders had promised they would, to uh, support him. And this gives rise, of course, to a movement known as the Tawabun, the penitents uh, amongst the people of Kufa, who um, were deeply ashamed of what they'd failed to do, and they fa their failure to support Hussein. And this gives rise, of course, I'm sure it's familiar territory to a lot of you, to the uh, flagellations and the, the whipping of themselves that, that goes, um, that is characteristic of um, uh, Iranian, particularly uh, commemoration of uh, Ashura, commemoration of the uh, death of Hussein. People feeling they still punishing themselves for the fact that their predecessors 1,500 years ago had failed to support Hussein. But the point that I, uh, the, because I'm really discussing is um, Umayyad legitimacy here, was that the uh, death of Hussein, uh, rapidly Hussein was seen as a martyr amongst the people of Iraq. Nobody in Syria was terribly interested as far as we can tell about this. But amongst the people of Iraq, uh, Hussein was seen as the lost leader, the martyr, the, and Hussein's children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, 12 generations, in fact, no, 8, 10 generations, um, after that uh, become the focus of anti-Umayyad movement in Iraq. And the whole ideology of the uh, family of the Prophet, the whole ideology of, um, of the importance of the family of the Prophet is generated in Iraq in this period. 
And this meant that the Umayyads were never generally accepted in Iraq. And I come back to the point that Iraq was the richest province of the Caliphate, the most populous. There were more Muslims in Iraq probably than the whole of the rest of the Caliphate put together at this stage. So um, Umayyad rule was forever a bit precarious, shall we say. But there was always the possibility for popular resistance um, in Iraq. And the final point in this bit is that the Umayyads attempted to um, counter this by sending Syrian soldiers to Iraq, to rule Iraq, and to keep order in Iraq in the name of the, uh, of the uh, Umayyad caliphs. And this, of course, provoked enormous resentment in Iraq. The Syrian soldiers from the, the Syrian Arab Bedouin tribes basically were stationed in a city called Wasit, which you can still find on the maps, so the, the original site is now completely ruined. Uh, Wasit, which was called Wasit because it was halfway between Basra and Kufa, the two great cities of the early Islamic, um, uh, the early Islamic, place, uh, the early Islamic um, Iraq. And so, and they came to Iraq and they lived off the resources of Iraq. Now I know it sounds you know, a bit strange I'm going on about economic issues here, but they were, they were very real and the economics and the ideology are just very, very closely bound up here. That the people of uh, Iraq bitterly resented the fact that Syrians were coming, living in Iraq and living off the resources which they, the people of Iraq, thought to belong, should belong to them. And so we get this profound, uh, this profound resentment in Iraq and also later in, in Khorasan, in Iran, because most of the people, most of the Arab Muslims who settled in Khorasan, uh, which is the far northeast of Iran and what is now um, Turkmenistan and, and Uzbekistan, uh, were deeply resentful of the uh, what the Syrians and what the Umayyads and their Syrian supporters had done to Iraq. So, as I say, the Umayyad Caliphate, for all its strength at various stages, was very, had, was fundamentally insecure because there was this continuing, and it's the family of the Prophet, it's the descendants of Hussein, particularly, who provide the leadership, the figureheads around whom this uh, resentment grew up. So, while many Muslims accepted the uh, Umayyads as the legitimate caliphs, there was this always a strong and numerous body who rejected Umayyad rule, both on ideological grounds and on, as it were, political, regional, financial grounds. And this, the Umayyads never really succeeded in diffusing this. And when there were rebellions, they increasingly looked to military repression rather than negotiation. But Muawiyah had used negotiation. Later caliphs increasingly looked to military force to solve this problem with predictably unsatisfactory results. Now, what we've been talking about so far is essentially about uh, differences of opinion and rivalries within the Muslim community in the early stages. Um, uh, but what, of course, the other great thing that's going on at this stage, the other major change at this stage in the history of the uh, Middle East and, and the wider Islamic world, is, of course, the process of Islamic conquest, uh, which starts, of course, before the coming of the Umayyads, but continues under Umayyad uh, leadership. As I said, it's not leadership, it's, it's, it's under the Umayyad uh, Caliphate. And I thought it might be interesting to talk a bit about the nature of w what the Islamic conquests are about. And somebody raised a question earlier on uh, with me but, um, just at the start of the break. Uh, it was only it was you. <laughs> um, how the uh, Umayyad, uh, what was the nature of conquest and, and, and so on. And I think what I, w and because this is still, you know, this is still a live issue that's very much with us today. Uh, the sort of Islam was spread by the sword paradigm if you know, or cliche or whatever you can call it, 
uh, is still part of uh, some people's political rhetoric uh, today. And it's, I think, from a historian's point, one of the things a historian can do is just look at this and say, is this true? Is this what? And if it's true, how is it true? And blah, blah, blah. So what I want to do is interrogate this uh, paradigm. Now, I think that um, part of the, I think it's important thing fundamentally to recognize there are two separate processes involved in the Islamization of the uh, Middle East and what became the Arab lands and so on and, and, and so forth. And there are two separate processes. One is a process of conquest and the other is a process of conversion. And the two are linked, but they're not the same thing. A conquest is about military takeover and the establishment of, uh, firstly, Arab, uh, uh, but fundamentally Muslim ruling class and governing class. And these are the people who run the armies. These are the people who collect the taxes. These are the people who uh, provide the rulers and the governors of provinces and so on and so forth. And conquest is at least in part a violent process. Um, we find, for example, the great battles, well recorded great battles of, between the Muslims and the Byzantine rulers of Constantinople and so on, the Battle of the Armouk in 636, for example, where the Byzantine armies are defeated in a field battle. Um, the Battle of Cardassia and the other battles that follow in Iraq and Iran uh, and the, the destruction of the armies of the Sasanian Persians. The Sasanians are the, the dynasty that rules Iran before the coming of the, uh, of the Muslims. And these are violent confrontations between two armies. And almost without exception, the Arab Muslim armies defeated the uh, armies of the existing powers. And we could go into that in, in questions if people are, people are interested in that. But the actual, but there was another process going on in conquest, and we're still in conquest at the moment. There's another process going on in conquest is that once the armies of the great powers, the Byzantine Christian Greek-speaking empire of Constantinople and the uh, Sasanian Zoroastrian empire of I Iran, once the armies of these two great powers had been defeated, then there, on the whole, and there were exceptions, but on the whole the record shows that the Arab Muslim conquerors offered, shall we say, very easy terms to the um, existing inhabitants. And we get uh, records of a number of treaties uh, th with cities like Damascus and Jerusalem and so on that were made between the incoming Muslims and the inhabitants of these cities who were not, by and large, um, uh, you know, not part of the armies of the defeated. Uh, and the, the fundamental bargain was that we will leave you with your houses, your churches, sometimes the walls of your cities and so on, um, on condition that you do not help our enemies and on condition that you pay taxes. And um, this was a pattern of agreement that we find over and over again um, in the course of the Arab uh, Muslim conquests of these areas. So that it is the armies of the enemy are defeated, but most of the major urban centers and rural centers and, and, and so on come to an agreement with the conquerors uh, uh, on those sorts of, and that, that is the nature of the bargain. Um, the, and the conquest happens very quickly. There are two big phases of the conquest. There's the conquest immediately after the death of Muhammad, the prophet, uh, when uh, Tesco, Syria and I mean, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and uh, what is modern Iran uh, are conquered uh, by 650. We get the, the great uh, range of conquest. Syria, Iraq essentially uh, invaded and mostly conquered in 636, 637. Egypt conquered by uh, 641. 
uh, the whole of Iran, um, not necessarily completely conquered, but coming under Muslim rule by the year 650. And then there's a gap, and then in the middle Umayyad period, and sponsored by the Umayyad regime, there is a renewed burst of conquest from about 680 onwards, but particularly from 700 onwards, that sees 711, the conquest of um, Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, at uh, one end, and then in exactly the same, 705 to 715, the conquest of uh, Central Asia, if you like, Bukhara, Samarkand, and, and, and so on, and also 711 and 712, the conquest of Sindh uh, in southern Pakistan. So we get two waves of conquest, a first one and a second one. The um, process of conversion of the majority of the population to Islam, however, is much slower. You can imagine you have Islamic rule, but people, individuals, um, abandoning their Christian, Zoroastrian, Jewish faith, whatever, uh, uh, and moving to and moving to become uh, Muslims, is a process that happens over centuries, not just in a few decades or a few years, but a process that happens over centuries. It's a process that is almost entirely peaceful. There is no, the very very few records of forcible conversion, i.e. people being told either you become Muslims or we kill you, was very, was, um, there is a dialogue that says you accept Muslim rule or we kill you, but that accepting Muslim rule is not the same as becoming a Muslim, because as, as we know lots of Muslims have always lived, not so non-Muslims have always lived under Muslim rule, according to these sort of dhimmi arrangements that come in with the early, um, uh, with, with, with the early conquest. And as I say, the uh, process of conversion is uh, largely peaceful and it takes generations. We think, and a certain amount of scientific, or yeah, hopefully scientific research, reveals that in the 7th and 8th centuries, the first century or so, the rate of conversion was very slow. But by the early Abbasid period, by that's, we're talking about the late 8th and 9th century, the pace of conversion is much um, quicker. And many more people, it's a sort of, um, as the, the statisticians would call a bell curve, right? it's a curve that starts off quite slowly and then becomes much, much deeper. More people convert, so more people convert. It's a sort of cumulative, it's a social cumulative uh, change. Until by probably just before the start of the Crusades, shall we say around the year 1100, it's probably true that the majority of the people of uh, the central Muslim lands were converted to Islam. But that's four centuries of slow change. And there are, even after, and then there's more conversion in the later Middle Ages, but by the early modern period, you have still have a position where between 10 and 20% of the inhabitants of these areas remain non-Muslim, but the vast majority are now Muslims of one sort or another. So I think when we're looking at this, uh, as I say, this, this paradigm, this cliche of Islam being spread by the sword, I think that's a helpful way of deconstructing it. Um, there, there are battles, there is violence, but conversion to Islam is a, a, a very different sort of process. And People convert to Islam, of course, for all sorts of reasons, because they are uh, impressed with Islamic teaching and uh, the, the prophethood of the prophet and, 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 and so on. There's also um, people wanting to become part of the new community, become part of the elite community and so on. Um, I think there are people change their religions for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are ideological, spiritual, if you like. Some of them are material, and often it's a mixture of both in normal human behavior. People uh, convert for all sorts of reasons. And conversion to Islam becomes part of a different community. Part of different. There's a debate um, about what happens in the Roman Empire, which is perhaps in some ways a bit helpful to understanding a historical parallel. When the Romans conquer France, what they call Gaul, 
Uh, what happens is you get the imposition of Roman political rule, because they famously Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, etc., etc., um, and you get a Roman um, establishment. What happens in the next centuries is that most of the people of Gaul want to become Romans, in the sense that they want to adopt a Roman lifestyle, they want to dress like Romans, they want to eat Roman food, they want to go to the baths like Romans do, um, and they even sort of adopt a new religion, that is the worship of the emperor. And they want to acculturate to the new dominant power, the new dominant discourse. And so it is a bit with, with, with becoming a Muslim. Typically in places like Iran, becoming converted to Islam means leaving your village and going and living in a Muslim town. Your own little hijra, if you like. There's a hijra from the Zoroastrian villages to the Muslim towns. That's very characteristic. So becoming a Muslim is not just uh, reciting the Shahada and, and, and reading Quran. It's also about a change in lifestyle. Because when you move to the, from your village to the Medina, then not only do you go to the mosque, you also go to the Hamam. You're also um, eating Muslim food. And you're dressing like a Muslim. There are a whole lot of processes that, that go on during this period. And as I say, it, it is a slow process, but one that gathers pace. Um, it starts in the Umayyad period, it gathers pace after that. And um, so uh, when people raise this question about Islam being spread by the sword and so on, I think that's, the, that's as it were, the reply to it, or the deconstruction of this, the, the, this cliche, that we're looking at a number of different processes. Um, uh, uh, initial conquest certainly is a military operation. Um, uh, the, uh, the later developments are, are um, almost entirely peaceful. Uh, so I'll leave that there. And I think that it's important to notice that this is one of the things going on. But I want to, I think, to talk now about a little bit about administration. So I stressed um, when I just introduced the Umayyads that one of the things that was going on here was the laying of the foundations of an Islamic administration. And this is, I think, important for administrative history, but as I sort of hope to show in the next um, quarter of an hour or so, it's, it's important for all sorts of other more general cultural reasons as well. But let's get down to, uh, first and foremost, the administrative um, reasons here. And let's see, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, to write some things. If this pen works, which it doesn't really. Um, do, do you think we can, we've got one anyway. It's always, I should have brought my own, I usually do, but I, yeah. see how we're doing, because I want to write out one or two. Yeah. Um, uh, one or two, well, sort of. <laughs> anyway, I'll do, I'll, do, I'll do my best. I should have brought my own pen. Um, I want to talk about the foundations of an Islamic administration. Yeah, sure, sure. This is, um, yeah, that's a nice one. The, when the, and Islamic administration is fundamentally formed in Iraq. Uh, not, as you might imagine, the capital in Syria, but the outlines of the Islamic administration are formulated in Iraq. What happens in Iraq is this, that a, a, a very considerable number of Arab Bedouin tribesmen, that's pastoral peoples, uh, move from eastern and uh, northeastern Arabia into Iraq. Uh, they are they make their hijra, and the, the term is, 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 is used for this process, they make their hijra to the new Islamic cities, and particularly the cities of Kufa and Basra, which are the sort of paradigms for the early Islamic city, Kufa and Basra. And these cities are given the name of Misr, which of course we all think of as being referring to Egypt. But Egypt was just one of the original. Misa Amsar is, is the Arabic plural of this word. And I'll talk a, a bit about that. But when they move, of course, from the, um, the landscape of the desert into living in towns, they lose, they don't just stop, start living in a different environment. They also lose their means of subsistence. 
Because if you're living in a town, you can't sort of live a better lifestyle. You can't live off your camels and your sheep and so on in the way that you can if you're a pastoral person wandering around. So you have to find a new means of support. And what seems to have happened very early after the uh, initial Islamic conquest, and we're told that the system was set up by Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second of the caliphs, was that the local that uh, the people were settled in towns and they were paid uh, what you might call a salary or you might call a pension. The people who had been involved in the conquest, they were paid a sum of money that the Arab word calls atar. And atar is about, it means a gift, but it's not just a, a present that you might give to somebody on, a, on a, their birthday or anything. It is a regular payment of uh, money. Um, to the Arab Muslim conquerors and to their descendants. Now this was, a, as I said, I believe, and other people would disagree with me, uh, that this is something that was established very soon after the conquest because these people had to live. If they were going to live in towns, they had to live off something. Uh, they weren't, as it were, trained to be carpenters or shipbuilders or whatever that, that's not the background they came from. Uh, they, were, they didn't have much background in trade. Uh, they were paid as, the, as a dominant uh, military class. And they weren't just paid in anything, they were paid in coined money. Now this may seem a little bit funny thing to stress. Uh, the early Islamic coinage, of course, uh, introduced, and I'll talk a bit more about coinage later on, in the Umayyad period, the silver dirham and the gold dinar. And if you want to see what these coins look like, uh, there are excellent examples in the Addis Gallery, that's the, the Islamic Art Gallery in the British Museum. It, you can, five minutes walk from here, you can just walk in and see them. Um, the silver dirham is a coin a bit like a ten pence piece, but thinner. The uh, gold dinar is about the size of a si uh, five pence piece, but again thinner. Um, these precious metal coins were the universal uh, coinage of the early Islamic world. And as I say, I'll come along a bit more uh, to that. So here's the thing. The early Islamic uh, state, even before the coming of the Umayyads, uh, established a mechanism where taxes were collected from the conquered people and were paid in salaries, attar, to the conquerors and to the descendants of the conquerors. It was initially a um, hereditary payment. This was the idea that if you had, and I come back to this idea of serbica, if you had serbica within Islam, then you had a much higher rate of atta than if your uh, ancestors had been a bit slow off the mark and had only joined the Muslim conquering uh, Muslim conquest after the death of the Prophet when everything was going well, by then you didn't have sabaka or not you know, much inferior sabaka, and your, um, uh, your salary was, you know, pension was const uh, consequently reduced. So it's a, it's a hierarchy, there are different grades and so on. Now, this is important because it means that in the Islamic world, the tradition of public taxation was continued into the Umayyad period, i.e. The, the expectation that everyone pays taxes, the sort of expectation that we have in, in, in a modern state. Now, what makes this distinctive is there are lots of other areas that had been ruled by the Roman Empire where the system of public taxation disappears. It disappears in all of Northwest Europe where essentially uh, different warlords, call them barons or call them whatever you like, call them, take over different areas and they just extract such money and uh, largely uh, goods in kind, i.e. food and, and so on, from the people they're ruling over. A very primitive sort of administration, but you don't need a state to run it. You just need strong men with swords going and sort of uh, extracting it, beating people up if necessary. I mean, it's a very simple sort of... Well, the, the, there's no government really in any meaningful sense in this sort of society. And even uh, just across the border in the Byzantine Empire, to a large extent, uh, this public taxation or the use of coinage for public taxation uh, disappears. 
What happens in the Umayyad state, on the other hand, is that taxes continue to be collected and they're paid out in coined money to people who are soldiers or administrators and live in cities. Now you can see immediately that this is a very different sort of society from the much more primitive societies of, of, of Northwest Europe. And, but this has a lot of important consequences. The most obvious of this is in order to run a system like this, you need to have a state. You need to have a government apparatus. You can't just do it on a sort of ad hoc basis. You need to keep records of who needs to pay what taxes. You need to keep records of who's going to get the payments. You need, in fact, to have a literate bureaucracy. You can't just do this by remembering in the back of your mind, you know, this, that, and the other. And so because of this, a whole lot of institutions grow up that, um, or a whole lot of institutions are developed um, during the Umayyad period, and a little bit before I come to the exact chronology. And amongst these institutions are the institution of the Diwan. The Diwan. Now, the, the Diwan in early Islamic period is the list of people who need to be paid. It's a register of people divided, as we know, we know none of the Diwans survive, uh, at least in their entirety. None of the Diwans survive from this period, but it's a list of people who need to be paid, how much they need to be paid, which tribe they belong to, and so on and so forth, and which area they were going to be paid for. And the word Diwan is a very interesting word, if you're interested in the way words migrate and so on, because the word Diwan comes into modern English in two very distinct ways. It comes into modern English, um, or not modern European languages, I better be a bit careful about this. D1 as a government office uh, is adopted in the, generally speaking, in the medieval Mediterranean. And it comes into French as douane for taxes, into Italian as dogana for Oh, sorry, for customs, Italian for Dogana for customs, Doana in Spanish, and so on. All the southern European Latin words for customs offices and accounting and so on come from the Arabic D1. Sorry, I'll just press that by mistake. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, come from the Arabic word D1 because it, it reflects the Arabic, the influence of Arabic in, 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 the, in the Mediterranean world. But it also. Um, comes into English as divan or divan, meaning a bed or a couch without a, a head and so on. And, it, and this meaning of it comes, um, because the pronunciation you'll recognize is not diwan but divan, uh, comes from Persian originally, Persian pronunciation, uh, through the Ottoman Empire, uh, where the divan <laughs> is not the office itself, but the bench on which the, um, uh, the administrative officials sit. And then it comes into Western Europe with its, its meeting and meaning of a couch or a bed without a head or so on. But in both senses, it's very interesting. It's early Islamic coinage because new early Islamic, early Arabic Umayyad period, in fact, um, uh, use of this word has had so much influence in quite unexpected ways. And it's, it's, it's worth, uh, it, it reflects, I think, the importance of the administrative arrangement. Now, the consequences of this development, the maintaining of a public taxation system, and the collection and payment of taxes has a profound effect on the, in the Umayyad period and later, on the Middle East. In order to run a system like this, you need a government apparatus. You need a, what is really a state. Uh, in the sense that we understand a state, a state that collects taxes and pays salaries. Well, that's what really states do, isn't it? To armies and so on. And uh, early Arabic has a word for this, which is, and the word is sultan. Now we think of sultan, I think, mostly as a, a, as a title. You get the Ottoman sultans, for example. But in early um, historical Arabic, 
up till the 10th century. Sultan is an abstract word. It means the authorities, the administration, the state. Okay, so in the Umayyad period, in response to the system, you get a real state apparatus. You get paid tax collectors, paid bureaucrats, people keeping records in archives of what they, what they need to collect, but also what they've done, and so on in a way that uh, you simply don't get in Western, European, in Western Europe during this, uh, this period. And so you, you can talk about an early Islamic state. Historians, um, medieval historians particularly, are very cautious about using the word state because they often say, what is the state and so on. But in the early Islamic world, we can definitely, because of this vocabulary, because of the use of the word sultan, we, and because of the tax apparatus, we can definitely recognize in Umayyad society, a society that has a state. And um, in many ways, that was the most um, important and lasting achievement of the Umayyad uh, uh, caliphate, was to develop this apparatus. Um, and it, the apparatus, or the uh, uh, man who seems to have originally set up this system, with the approval of the Caliph Umar al-Khattab um, and subsequently of Ali, was a man called Ziad. Um, and I say, and he was called Ziad, and he has a variety of names. Um, he is sometimes, by people who didn't like him essentially, called Ziad ibn Abihi, because uh, nobody, they said, knew who his father was. Um, i.e., he came from a slightly, by the standards of the time, slightly dodgy background. Or he, and in fact he was this, this, this illegitimate child, um, or he's also known as Ziad ibn Abi Sufyan. And that's how he signed himself. Well, that, we know that's what he called himself because that's the name that appears on the coins that were issued in his name. So he called himself Ziad ibn Abi Sufyan, i.e. he was a half-brother of the Caliph Muawiyah. And he was appointed as the first Umayyad governor of uh, southern, of Iraq by Muawiyah. And it seems to, he, we know he was an educated man, and we know he had a good Arabic education, a good apparently mathematical education and so on. And he was, seems to have been the man who de set up this system of administration, actually made it work in southern Iraq. He died during the reign of Muawiyah. His son, Ubaidallah ibn Ziyad, was the man who was responsible for the killing of Hussein. Um, but um, his father has, is, is a key figure in the development of uh, Islamic administration. But this goes way beyond just setting up the institutions of the state. Because during the reign of the Caliph Abdul Malik, and you'll find it's, it's uh, 685 to 705, you'll find the name on, on that list of Umayyad caliphs. Uh, Abdul Malik uh, decreed that the administration should all be conducted in Arabic. And um, previously, the administration, particularly tax collecting, had been done in Greek in the western half of the Islamic Empire, i.e. those bits that have been part of the Roman Empire before, and in the Eastern Roman Empire, Greek was the language of administration, not Latin. And we know that this continued to be the case because there survived from Egypt a lot of papyri, little fragments of papyrus that have, right from, in fact, the earliest days of the Muslim conquest, there are fragments of papyrus surviving which show us an administration working in Greek and also sometimes in Arabic, but uh, fundamentally, at a local level, stuff happened in Greek. And uh, we must presume no papyri survive from Syria or only because the climate's too wet, but in Egypt so dry that these things uh, 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 survive. So we have very early testimony for the fact that the early Muslims continued to use Greek. And we have bits and pieces of documents as well from Iran, which show that tax collection happened in um, in Middle Persian, I, it's a predecessor of modern Persian, which was the language of the Sasanian Empire. Okay. Then in 685, 
uh, Abdul Malik uh, decides that the administration should all be done in Arabic. We can see this, uh, we know this from accounts in Chronicles that this is what happened. We can see it happening in the case of the coinage. And here again, if you're at all interested in these things, the um, Addis Gallery at the British Museum has a very nice little display of coins. And we can see how the earliest coins that were, um, the earliest Islamic minted coins come from the reign of Mawawi. They are silver dirhams that look just like Sasanian silver dirhams, i.e. they have the picture of the ruler on their head. But they're counterstruck with a bismillah and the name of the governor Ziad, i.e. somebody's taken the coins when they're being minted and put a little extra bit on them to show that these are Islamic coins. So that's what they did. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of rough and ready way of providing coinage, but also giving this coinage a Muslim identity with the bismillah, even though you have the portrait of a Sasanian ruler on it. It's a sort of uh, mixture and so on. Then in the reign of um, Abdul Malik, there was an attempt to create an iconographic, i.e. picture coinage, uh, that was particularly Islamic. I mean, it may seem a bit strange to people, uh, uh, the idea that the Islam forbids the uh, depiction of the human figure and so on, which was only ever partly true, but uh, we might come to that later on. But the fact that the, um, there's an attempt to, de de um, to design a pictorial coinage, and what it comes in, in the early years of Abdul Malik's reign is the idea of the standing caliph coins. And there are very good examples of that in the British Museum collection, where the figure on the front is um, not the Sasanian ruler or, 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 or the Byzantine ruler or anything, but a, a caliph standing with a sword and a recognizably um, Arab headdress and a beard uh, on the front of the coin. And this was tried. And then for whatever reason, we don't really know why, that was completely abandoned. And uh, around the year 700, we start to get the emergence of a completely new style of coin, which just has an inscription on it. No pictures at all. It has an inscription. And of course, the inscription is in Arabic. And uh, there's usually a Quranic phase, phrase, a phrase from Quran. Um, there is usually the date on which this coin was produced, and usually the place where it's produced, particularly in the case of the silver coinage. We can see where it was minted and when it was minted. And we also often have the name of the governor or caliph who caused it to be minted. So actually, these coins pack a lot of information in them. And they're, they're, there's historical documents. They're very useful, um, because, um, partly because unlike the texts, the historical texts, they clearly date from the period that, um, uh, from the Umayyad period. But also, they meant that Arabic was diffused far and wide. People in the remotest areas of Iran had pieces of money with Arabic written on them. So we get the Arabization of the tax records and tax collecting records. We get the Arabization of the coinage. We get things like, um, particularly in uh, Greater Syria, we get the setting up of milestones beside the road, uh, which have inscriptions in Arabic. The Romans used to put up milestones, and they had you know, so many miles to Caesarea, or whatever it was, and it had the name of the emperor on it, and blah, blah, blah. Abdul Malik produces Arabic milestones that look very like the Roman milestones. They are public Arabic documents. Uh, so to speak, that every passerby on the road sees, and those who can read them, read them. And um, this is interesting and important, um, because both the coinage and the Arabic, for two reasons. Firstly, they show that, and Abdul Malik seems to have been the driving force in this, they show that the Umayyad Caliph was setting up an administration that in many ways borrowed from the Roman administration, the Persian administration. It was an imperial government, if you like. It was a state government, and the state announced its existence in an Arabic coinage, in Arabic administrative documents, in Arabic milestones, 
and sometimes in inscriptions as well. A couple of examples, one very famous and one new and not nearly so famous of the use of inscriptions, public writing, in fact. Uh, the first is, is the inscription in, in the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which I thought is something I'll come back to uh, this afternoon. Uh, the inscription of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is the earliest public writing in Arabic. Uh, it undoubtedly, despite the fact that the name of the caliph was changed from um, uh, Abdul Malik to the Arab Abbasid Caliph al Ma'mun in a rather sort of cheeky um, uh, attempt to uh, immortalize himself, um, the, there's no doubt this inscription dates from the time of Abdul Malik. It is Quranic, or uh, there are a lot of phrases that come from Quran, but it's not a passage of Quran. It's different phrases that are recognizably Quranic, but it, it's not um, a single text of Quran. And it proclaims uh, the work of Abdul Malik, and it, the rest of it is essentially um, exalting Islam above Christianity. It's essentially concentrating on Tawheed and essentially concentrating on uh, um, monotheism as opposed to uh, the shirk and the Trinitarianism of Christianity. So it's making, it, it's packing a big punch uh, ideologically. But from the point of view of what I'm talking about now, the interesting thing is in Arabic. But uh, Arabic inscriptions were used at a much more humble level. Recently in the um, city of Baysan, Schizopolis, uh, now in northern Israel, there was, uh, there was a lot of excavation. Um, an inscription was found. And this inscription was found in a building that everybody had assumed was a Roman or Byzantine building. It had columns with arches on top and blah, blah, blah. It looked, it looked very like a classical building. And then when they came to excavate it, they found a mosaic inscription which said that this souk was built by the local governor, who's now in Isaac and I think, but it doesn't matter, on the orders of the Umayyad Caliph Hisham. And there we see, again, we see two very interesting things happening, of course, the, 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 the Caliph ordering the building of a souk, the local governor building the souk, and putting an Arab mosaic inscription up to um, commemorate this and to make this public, um, an inscription that everyone could see. So what we're getting is something really important happening here. Until the time of Abdul Malik, uh, Arabic obviously had been used for Quran, and we must assume that there's not much evidence for it. There is a sort of proto-hadith that is emerging, an early hadith that is emerging in Arabic. But Arabic was therefore essentially the language of religion. Uh, the administration was conducted in Greek or Persian. What Abdul Malik does is ensure that uh, Arabic, as it were, moves out of the religious zone. It, is, it moves out into the world of secular administration, the world of public life. And this has, of course, lots of effects. It ensures that the Middle East became not just Muslim but Arab speaking, except for Iran. And I, you know, I've written quite a lot about why Iran doesn't become an Arab country, but I don't want to go down that road at the moment because it's, it's, it's a different discussion. Um, but it ensures that, and these, there was nothing inevitable about that. It could have been a situation where Arabic was the language of religion and religious discourse and hadith and so on, but everyone carried on speaking Greek or Coptic or, 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 or Middle Persian or whatever, or whatever they were doing. Um, and that would, you know, there are lots of parallels, the use of Latin in medieval Europe, for example. I mean, people in um, Anglo-Saxon England spoke Anglo-Saxon, which is a Germanic language, uh, but for purposes of religion, and religious discussion and the Bible and so on, that was all in Latin. And these two, for centuries, this sort of diglossia, these two different languages, functioned together with different roles in society. And Islamic society could easily have gone down that road. And as I say, Arabic would be like medieval Latin, the language of, of, of certain sorts of uh, religious sciences and so on. That this was not the case was really a result of decisions made by I think particularly of the, the, the Caliph Abdul Malik. 
and this pushed Arabic out um, because everybody, as I say, everyone in the remotest areas of Iran or southern Morocco or something, had coins with Arabic written on them. And they might have said, oh, I can't understand a word of this and I'm not going to bother. But lots of people would have become familiar with Arabic that sort of way, in, 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 in that sort of way, and through the administration and so on. But the importance of this decision just doesn't end with the prevalence of Arabic. Because what happens also is you get a whole lot of bureaucrats, a whole a lot of civil servants, if you like, who are using Arabic now um, to uh, conduct their affairs and originally conduct their administration and so on. Lots of people are learning Arabic. Lots of people whose fathers and grandfathers had spoken Greek or Coptic or, or Middle Persian are now learning Arabic. Nobody, in, by the, the end of the Umayyad period, nobody is learning Greek in Syria, Palestine, Egypt. They're not learning Greek, except as they're particularly interested in, in scripture and so on. They're not learning Greek because there are no jobs in Greek anymore. If you want to get a, a decent job, you have to know Arabic even if you're learning it as a complete stranger, a complete non-Arab. So non-Arabs are learning Arabic, and by and by, of course, their sons and grandsons are thinking of themselves as Arabs, and in a way that people change their identity according to, according to their language and so on and so forth. And so uh, you get the uh, spreading of um, Arabic into the administrative vocabulary, and then it goes into secular literature, and every sort of literature starts being written in Arabic. We get, by the end of the Umayyad period, uh, the secretary of the last um, Umayyad Caliph, Marwan II, composes uh, a number of epistles, letters, about administration, about political philosophy, really, and he composes them in Arabic. By the late Umayyad period, early uh, Abbasid period, Arabic is being used for everything. Uh, to do everything apart from a certain amount of Christian uh, uh, church literature and so on. But everything else is, is in Arabic. Arabic, And this is the background to that astonishing flourishing of Arabic literature that happens in, from the late Umayyad through into the Abbasid period where you get the great poems, great uh, his, historical works being composed and so on. All this is now happening in Arabic. But if the Umayyad Caliph had not made, if Abdul Malik, I, I really believe this, if Abdul Malik had not taken a certain number of decisions, it might have been completely different. It might well have been that secular literature and, and so on continue to be in Greek and so on and so forth. Though there are, there are other influences um, in, uh, at work here, of course. Uh, with the influence of Islamic poetry is very important, uh, for example. But, um, I think it's the administrative Arabic that is driving Arabic, and, as I say, pushing, rolling out Arabic is perhaps what the modern administrators would, and modern governments would talk about, rolling out Arabic throughout the Islamic world. To the extent that by the end of the Umayyad period, the Melkite Christian Church, either the Greek Orthodox Christian Church in um, uh, Syria, Palestine and so on, uh, is celebrating church services in Arabic, not Greek anymore, and people are writing Christian theological texts in Arabic, because that's what you do. And the old languages like Syriac and Coptic in Egypt become dead languages. They retreat to the cloister. And Coptic is still Coptic, which is Coptic is basically ancient Egyptian, um, uh, written in, in Greek letters. And Coptic uh, disappears, it shrinks back into just some monasteries and some religious usages and so on. It disappears as a vernacular. It disappears as a, really as a literary language in, a, in, in any meaningful sense. So I think it's, it, if we're looking for asking that sort of question about what did the Umayyads do for us, um, one of the answers is make, that make sure that the Middle East was not just Islamic but was Arabic speaking as well. And as I say, the stress, it need not necessarily have been so. What I thought I'd talk about in this session is the uh, later Umayyad Caliphate and 
or how it evolves, and look at the end about why it collapsed, why the um, Umayyad Caliphate failed to survive. And um, here are the list of caliphs. Uh, I'll help you. There are two um, phases, if you like, of the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, and um, they are rather different in character. Some of this is, is stuff I've talked about before, but we can talk about the Sufyanids in, a, in that Anglophone way. Uh, Sufyanids and the Marwanids. The Sufyanids are basically uh, the descendants of Abu Sufyan, as you imagine. Uh, that's Muawiyah and his son Yazid, who ruled just for three or four years. And then there were two other very short-lived caliphs, Muawiyah II and so on, we don't need to worry about. And then the Sufyanid line um, died out. There was then a major, major crisis in the Umayyad Caliphate when it almost disappeared. I mean, it was almost a two-generation caliphate. Um, Muawiyah and Yazid, because with the uh, death of Yazid, there were challenges. Uh, the, the Yazid had sons, but they were small boys, they, and apparently not very well either. We don't really know what, but they died very young. And um, the question, that meant that the whole question of succession was again up in the air within the Muslim community. And we get uh, a number of different uh, groups trying to uh, take power. Uh, the most important of these, uh, the most important of these figures was probably Abdullah ibn Zubair. I'll talk a bit more about, uh, I'll talk about for a bit, I'll just call it ibn Zubair. And the other group were led by a person called Mukhtar. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about both of these because they show that in this crisis of the caliphate, there was nothing automatic about the Umayyad caliphate continuing. It was, um, there were other people who were just as good claims. Ibn Abdullah ibn Azubair was the son of that Azubair who had been one of the closest of the Sahaba to the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, he had been a muhajir from Mecca to uh, Medina right in, in the foundations, if you like, of the uh, Islamic community, of the Ummah. Um, he had, uh, in one of the first of, of, of the civil wars, um, he had been uh, defeated, and I think I'm right in saying killed, at the Battle of the Camel at the start of Ali's reign, which is not something I haven't talked about because it, it's not directly Umayyad material. But his son had a very, he was Quraysh, he was living in the Haramain. I think he was, he was actually living in Mecca. Um, and he had a reputation for um, being, being both brave and pious. And even his enemies conceded that. And he claimed the caliphate on, uh, after the death of Yazid on the basis that the caliph Fate should be decided amongst the um, leading members of the, uh, of, the, of the Muslim community. It shouldn't be an Umayyad family thing. Now the, Umayyad, the Umayyads had done their thing, okay. Muawiyah had been a great caliph, Yazid had been a bit uh, less impressive. Now they were gone, Anybody, you know, it's up to other people to claim the caliphate. And he, as a, the son of his father, um, as a, a Sahabi himself, though he must have been quite a small boy, but nonetheless he that still counts, um, claimed the caliphate. And his platform, if you like, was that the caliphate should be returned to Medina, that uh, it was an anti-Syrian thing, and that it, the real power should be rested in Quraysh and the Sahaba and their descendants. It was an attempt to grab the caliphate back from Syria and back from the Umayyad family to restore it, if, as, as Ibn al-Zubayr would have said, to, the, um, uh, to its origins, get right back to the, the early Muslim community and the descendants of those first Muslims 
who had gathered around Abu Bakr and Umar al-Khattab. Ibn Zubayr uh, attracted a lot of support, including some in Syria, but not much in Iraq. And in the end, it was clear that you, that the, the, the Haramain, the Hijab, you couldn't rule the Muslim world from Mecca and Medina. It was too remote, there weren't enough resources uh, to do that. And um, in the end, his attempts to, to spread uh, his, uh, his word and his, um, and, and his propaganda uh, failed and famously he was besieged in Mecca by the Umayyad troops, uh, by the Umayyad troops led by a man who we're going to come back to, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi. And in an event which became famous and notorious in Islamic history, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf besieged uh, Ibn Zubayr in Mecca. Uh, it was typical of Ibn Zubayr's perhaps even romantic attempt to bring the caliphate back to the heartlands of Islam, that he chose to make his last stand in Mecca, which is a completely hopeless place to defend because it's, the water supply is very unreliable, there's no natural food supply, everything has to be brought in, or most things have to be brought in, and so on. From a, a strategic military point of view, defending Mecca was not an intelligent move. From an emotional and religious point of view, it exactly was what Ibn Zubayr was all about. And um, he was, the, and um, uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf set up uh, uh, siege engines, these big catapults, stone-throwing catapults, and bombarded the Kaaba. Uh, and uh, that was something that much later, at the time of the Abbasid Revolution, that was one of the things people remembered about the um, Umayyads, was the bombardment of the Kaaba, the uh, damaging of the Kaaba. Ibn was about was um, it's very interesting, man. He's always described as a sort of anti-caliph or a rebel or something like that. But for lots of people, he was the real caliph. And interestingly, I believe to the, this to be the case, that the Kaaba as it stands today was essentially the Kaaba that was um, reconstructed by Ibn Zubayr. And the literature is not clear, and obviously there's been no archaeology of the Kaaba. But it, it looks as if from the early histories of Mecca, uh, the early Arabic histories of Mecca, that the Kaaba in the form that we have was, was, was built by Ibn Zubayr. And it had to be reconstructed after the damage uh, of the siege engines. It had to be rebuilt. Uh, the various stages of floods and disasters and so on that damaged bits and pieces of it. And, but it was always reconstructed along the Ibn Zubayr lines. And Ibn Zubayr, of course, was, was building, in a sense, on the, on the previous Kaaba, but he seems to have developed it in various ways. It's not always easy to work out what's going on. But I got involved in this discussion. Some of you may have been to the Hajj exhibition in the British Museum. Uh, and I wrote the chapter on the early medieval Hajj in the book that went with it. So I got involved in trying to find out what the Arabic sources tell us about the building of the Kaaba, which is, uh, which is you'd think was a really important issue, but there's very little literature, very little discussion about it and uh, the uh, whole architecture of the Kaaba and so on. So anyway, that's why I got involved in Ibn Zubayr and, 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 and the Kaaba and so on. So Ibn Zubayr was defeated and killed. There was a more vigorous and dangerous um, uh, proto shi revolt in Iraq. And somebody was asking about Ibn al-Hanafiya earlier today, the son of the Hanafite woman who was the half-brother, therefore, of Hassan al-Hussein. Um, and he had a rep he seems to have not ever been to Iraq himself, but a whole body of Iraqi opinion settled around the, um, the figure of Mukhtar, Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid, led the people of Iraq against Umayyad rule and so on. And uh, the whole of Iraq was really lost to the Umayyads. Uh, but the Umayyads struck back. The Marwan the first, and above all his son Abdul Malik, who I've talked about before, uh, recovered the Umayyad position, and they recovered the Umayyad position. They were able to do that, I think, um, well, partly 
Abdul Malik was an extremely able man, as I probably uh, um, suggested to you, uh, with his administrative innovations and so on. They were able to do it because they had the wholehearted support of the Ahl al-Sham, or at least they, they came to have the support of the, the Ahl al-Sham. And whereas the people of, uh, whereas Ibn Zubayr was uh, you know, in, 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 in the wrong place, so to speak, from a military point of view, and the people of Iraq, whereas often happened in the early Islamic period, very much divided into different groups. Um, fairly soon, the uh, Umayyads, uh, uh, represented by Abdul Malik, the son of Marwan, which is why that group of Umayyads are called Marwanids, because Marwan was a, a, a cousin of Muawiyah, not a direct, direct descendant, um, united the Ahl al-Sham. And it was the Ahl al-Sham that uh, enforced uh, Umayyad rule in Mecca and Medina and in Iraq. And their uh, enforcer uh, and the leader of the, the Umayyad part was this man, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And I'll come to him a little more in a second. But the nature of the Umayyad regime changed. I stressed in the talking about, uh, when we were talking about Muawiyah, the, we were looking at a sort of federal structure. Muawiyah made agreements with local Arab elites and they it was a, a decentralized system much more. What happens under Abdul Malik is that the, uh, the Umayyads and the Ahl al-Sham conquer the rest of the Islamic world, basically. Uh, uh, they conquer Mecca and Medina and they conquer Iraq in a series of battles against the uh, supporters of the Ahl al-Bayt, the supporters of the family of the Prophet, and also against the tribal leaders of Iraq as well, who are a different group not necessarily Ahl al-Bayt, but um, people who came from the great Iraqi tribes of, of Tamim and um, Abdul Qais and so on. Uh, and there were a series of large-scale battles in which the Syrians uh, took Iraq um, and uh, talking about the establishment of the city of Wasit. In a way, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate changed into a Syrian military dictatorship, if you like. The tribes of Syria formed the elite of the army. They were the ruling class. They were the ruling group. And in Iraq, we get this continuing resentment against the uh, dominance of the Syrians and the way that, and something important happens under Hajjaj. That's a Hajjaj is a figure of the Umayyad period. He was, the, he was um, the governor of Iraq and all the east. The caliphate was essentially divided on unofficial basis between uh, the Umayyad family, who ruled essentially the Syria, Egypt, and points west, and, the, um, and Hajjaj, at least up to his death in 714, who ruled um, Iraq and all the east. He also a figure who lingers long in the Arabic literary administration, uh, sorry, literary memory, not administration, literary memory, as the example of the fierce, stern ruler. Fierce, stern, but ultimately within his own life's just ruler. Uh, he's, there's a, the, the later Arabic sources and the contemporary Arabic sources, indeed, uh, probably, have a very mixed view of him. I mean, he's fierce, implacable, a great public speaker. Uh, some of uh, Hajjaj's um, sermons to the people of Kufa, where he says uh, all about how he, he sees necks with heads waiting to roll in the congregation in, in front of him and so on. These sort of, this sort of rhetoric is so often quoted in later sources about, you know, uh, the strong, heartless, efficient, incorruptible governor is what uh, and so there's a sort of half admiring, half condemning attitude to her judge. And it, it reflects the way in which he, he, his personality dominated what went on in Iraq. And there was a major dispute. And the dispute was this. Um, it comes back to the question of, um, I was talking about the question of Attar, the question of payment and so on. It comes down to money in the end. And it comes down to money because the question was, the early Muslims had been 
in, in Iraq, and it all happened in Iraq in the end, um, had been uh, paid according to how their families had participated in the conquest. And there was the general idea that the revenues that were collected in Iraq should be distributed among the Ahl al-Iraq uh, because it was in a sense their, theirs. And, and I don't want to uh, give you too many Arabic words, but there's an Arabic word called fay, uh, F-A-Y, and the fay is the, the revenues of Iraq, the whole lot, the whole pot, if you like, of the revenues that are collected in Iraq, which were huge. Um, and the idea of many people was that the fate of Iraq should be distributed among the Ahlul Iraq, i.e. the Muslim people of Iraq. All the collectors that were collected there should be spent there. And if there was any left over, some of it might go to the administration in Damascus, but basically it should be distributed amongst the Ahlul Iraq. It, they'd conquered it, their ancestors had conquered it, it was theirs by right. And furthermore, they could argue that uh, this right to the control of the Fay had, and the, to get their attar from the Fay, had been approved by Umar ibn al-Khattab, that Ali ibn Abi Talib had confirmed these rights. And so the right to the Fay of Iraq for the Ahl al-Iraq becomes not just part of their dunya, not just part of their earthly administration, but it becomes part of their deen as well. It, because of this religious sanction, because the two great, greatest legislators of early Islam had, they claimed, um, uh, organized this, why, uh, had, 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 you know, stipulated this, why then they had this right to it. Now, this, of course, um, allowed no position for the Umayyad administration in Damascus to take any share of the revenues of Iraq. And I've already stressed that Iraq was the most valuable area. And so there developed a titanic struggle for power between the uh, Umayyad um, administration, represented by Hajar ibn Yusuf and the Syrian military, and the people of Iraq. And this came down to, in the end, rebe rebellion after rebellion, led um, by two different groups of people. One were the tribal chiefs of um, Iraq. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of detail here, because these are, these are figures again whose people remembered centuries after. Uh, the greatest of the tribal leaders uh, was a man called Ibn al-Ashraf al-Kindi. Um, he's Ashraf like this. Um, Al-Kindi, Kindis were um, Al Kindis were a great South Arabian tribe, and Kinda Kinda was a great South Arabian tribe. K I N D I. I haven't written that very well. A great South Arabian tribe, and Ibn al-Ashraf al-Kindi. Um, was the greatest tribal leader of, his, his, of, of, of the early 8th century in Iraq. Um, and certainly this is another, the whole concept of tribal leaders, it's another word whose meaning changes, which you, you, you might be interested. The use of the word Sharif, with its plural Ashraf, um, in early Arabic, in early, uh, in Umayyad period Arabic, early Abbasid period Arabic, the word Sharif, Ashraf, uh, means a tribal leader, part of the aristocracy. Every, I mean, it wasn't just the Muslims who, uh, the community that um, uh, that had a, an Ahl al-Bayt. Uh, big tribes had uh, Ahl al-Bayt, the leading tribe, sometimes called the Buyutet, a sort of um, double plural of Bayt, meaning the, 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 the great families in, in an individual tribe. And these were called Sharif Ashraf. By the uh, 10th, 11th century, the word Sharif always means a descendant of the Prophet. Its, it's, it's meaning has been res restricted to the family of the Prophet, which is, of course, um, the uh, meaning it has right down to the 20th century. But in early Arabic, it means tribal chiefs. Anyway, I'll just put that on, on one side. And so there is this struggle for the resources of Iraq becomes the main battle. And um, the second group, who are, are, are people of the family, have family of the Prophet, who are not the same 
as the uh, leaders of the tribes. But members of the family of the Prophet, and the most important of these is Zayd ibn Ali, uh, who leads a rebellion in the year 740, 740 in Kufa. It was an unsuccessful rebellion, as they all were, but um, it gave rise to the movement that uh, uh, I was talking about earlier on that we know as the Zaydia. And the, the followers of Zayd and the descendants of, not always descendants of, um, and Zaydism owes, it, which is, is still, was for a long time important in areas of Iran, now mostly confined to northern Yemen where it's still a very active political force in Yemeni politics, of course, um, is, uh, is a direct, we can trace its origins to the rebellion of Zayd ibn Ali. Uh, nonetheless, uh, despite these struggles, uh, by the year, uh, shall we say, 740, when Zayd was killed, his rebellion was conspicuously unsuccessful, but as I said, it's this important um, ideological uh, and um, people, and uh, it's an important memory. Uh, Abbasid, uh, sorry, Umayyad control was established in Iraq. And in many ways, one of the less, least known but greatest of the Umayyad caliphs was the Caliph Hisham. But I mean, I'll come to him in a minute. So why don't I just go through? If you've got this list of caliphs, because they, the Arabic sources give them lots of very different personalities. And again, these personalities survive in historical literature, but also in poetry and so on. And they, lots of them have different characters. Abdul Malik I've said a lot about, and perhaps it better, just the final point about Abdul Malik, the great administrator and so on. He also had a great reputation as a transmitter of hadith and so on. He was just in the sense of definition, he was a Sahabi because he had been a small boy at the time of the, of the Prophet's life, and that was enough to count. But he also had a reputation for piety and uh, the transmission of um, Hadith, which is perhaps not surprising in a way for a, a member of the Umayyad family. Al Walid the first, we don't need to worry too much about. He was his father's son. I'll introduce, talk to him a bit more this afternoon about the builder as the builder of the mosque in Damascus. Um, he was succeeded by another son of Abdul Malik, Suleiman. Suleiman comes across in the Arabic source. He only rolled for a, a very little time, as you see, two years. He comes across in the Arab sources as uh, a man who loved luxury, comfort, extravagant, generous to poets, a builder. He founded the city of Ramla in southern Palestine, which became in the early Middle Ages one of the, uh, the most important cities in that area. So he comes across, as I say, as the luxury. Um, then we come to Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was in fact a nephew of Abdul Malik, who is known as Omar II. Umar II is an important figure in the later image of the Umayyad family because he is the one that later generations of Muslims under the Abbasid period um, thought of as the good Umayyad, the pious Umayyad. Uh, and after Umar ibn al-Khattab, he is a major legislator, if you like, or though that's not really a very good word in Islamic law, but he's a major generator of Islamic legal ideas. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, compared with Suleiman, how pious and um, ascetic he was, how he listened to scholars, how he um, tried to legitimize the tax system of the Umayyad state, which of course, as I said, is always a major bone of contention. And um, so he's a different figure, and he's the one, again and again, um, in, in later literature, uh, we find him praised as being the exception to the Umayyad rule at a time when uh, later critics, as it were, 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 were condemning the Umayyads. He's the one who escapes. Uh, Yazid II, oh, we well, don't need to worry about anyone uh, very much. And then we get the figure of Hisham. Hisham, you see, ruled for a long time. Hisham has a very interesting person. I mean, he's not a name that, that's a sort of um, 
uh, it's on everyone's lips, but he has a very interesting reputation again in the Islamic sources and later on as a strict puritanical ruler, um, a past Muslim, but not at all the luxury loving image of the Umayyads, but also repeatedly as a builder and developer the digger of canals, the founder of, the builder of water mills in the local history of Mosul of, of, that comes from the Islamic period, from the early Abbasid period, there's a long description about Hisham developing water mills on the, um, for grinding corn and so on in Mosul and so on, how he invested money in that and, and that sort of, he's a sort of, a bit of a, by the English analogy, a bit of sort of Farmer George amongst the um, uh, the Umayyad caliphs, and we found all sorts of what we might think as rather un Umayyad stories about how careful he was to make sure that he sold the crops of, from his estates at the right time for the right amount of money, how meticulous he was in looking after the, uh, uh, the assets of the state and, 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 and encouraging economic development and so on. Um, and he was also a great builder, and he shifted to the center of the Umayyad state the shift to the capital almost. He never, in fact, <coughs> the, the Umayyads seldom actually lived in Damascus. It was the administrative capital for most of the time. They seldom lived in Damascus. And just a sort of little, um, in brackets, bit here. We, the Umayyads, uh, the early Umayyads, but even Muawiyah and Abdul Mali, are said to have lived a sort of transhuman existence, if you know what I mean. They spent the summer in the Bakar Valley, where it was quite cool, where there was lots of water grazing on the mountainsides and so on, where they built a, a, a very interesting archaeological site, well, sorry, interesting city, which becomes an archaeological site, uh, Anjar and so on. They spent in the neighborhood of Baalbek. Then in the winter, in the autumn, they would go down to Damascus. And according to this account, which is the only one we really have of Umayyad lifestyles, uh, of the caliphs, they didn't actually stay in Damascus. They stayed in what either still was or had been a Christian monastery at a place called Deir Moran, which is up on the hills on the old Beirut road out of Damascus to the, uh, to the west. I, they didn't go down into the city, but they stayed outside the city in a slightly elevated, we don't know exactly where Deir Moran was, but we know it was somewhere in that area where there were sort of orchards and streams and so on, and that's where they stayed. And then in the winter, they went down to the Jordan Valley, where the climate is much more moderate than, than, than staying in either Damascus or, or, or the Bukhar Valley or anywhere else. And here they built a number of palaces around the Sea of Galilee, um, the famous uh, palace that's ascribed to Hisham at Qurbat al mafja for example. But also, um, a building has recently been identified as m probably Muawiyah's palace at the bottom end of the Sea of Galilee, uh, uh, sea of Galilee just where it goes down into, into the Jordan River at a place that the Arab sources call Sinabra. And, so, and then in the spring, they, they left the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley is not very nice in the summer. They left the Jordan Valley and went up again to Damascus, <coughs> calling through Damascus back into the Bakar to enjoy the cool and well-watered uplands of the Bakar Valley. So they led a slightly you know, Damascus was only part of where they were. Um, though there was Muawiyah, we know, had a palace in Damascus as well. Um, Hisham spent most of his time in northern Syria, uh, around uh, the area of the desert around Palmyra, up towards Rusafa, up towards the Euphrates, uh, and doesn't seem really to have come to um, uh, thing, uh, doesn't really seem to come to Damascus at all. His nephew succeeded him. His nephew is Walid II. Now, Walid has the, a very different reputation from Hisham. In fact, they two completely hated each other. And Hisham disproved very strongly of Walid. For Walid is the poet of the Umayyad Caliphate. His poetry survives in the great book of songs, the Kitab al Ghani, as a genuinely uh, a genuinely important contribution to Arabic literature. And he was a very gifted poet, singer, etc., etc. He also has the reputation as uh, liking what he thought of as a good life 
far too much. He seems to have lived almost completely in desert palaces. He never seems to have gone to administrative centers whatsoever. And in the desert palaces, he uh, lived as he chose. And his parties were famous for the amount of wine that was drunk, the number of um, attractive women there were, the number of poems that were sung and produced and so on. He was, um, he had this reputation, uh, which no doubt his enemies, of whom there were many, no doubt his enemies um, uh, assiduously propagated and, and, and spread abroad as a very unsatisfactory Islamic r ruler from an Islamic point of view, and indeed from an administrative point of view, because he doesn't seem to be interested in that whatsoever. Um, his main interest in life, in fact, was hunting, and uh, then all the other things came after that. But we actually have quite a sort of vivid impression of um, Walid uh, II's lifestyle from the little Jordanian palace at Kosair Amra, which some of you may have seen east of um, Amman, where the little bathhouse beside the wadi in, in the desert there was just part of a complex of buildings. It's the only one that survives. And these amazing wall paintings survive of astrological scenes, hunting scenes, um, building of the palace, and so on. Extraordinarily fluent and vivid um, paintings that have just been restored. And something interesting, which just shows you how new, new things can come up, there's a recent restoration project at the paintings at Kosair Amara, which has, for a variety of reasons, have been badly damaged and, uh, over the years, that's going on at the moment. Now, it's always been assumed that Kosair Amara, with its somewhat luxurious atmosphere and so on, was something to do with Walid II. What has happened last year is that somebody has actually found an inscription that talks about Walid and makes it absolutely, the connection between Kosai Ramra and Walid is now firm. And it's, he's not referred to as the Caliph. So the palace, and people have debated about the dating of the palace of Kosai Ramra for years and years. Uh, we now know that the palace must have been built by Walid before he became Caliph. Because if he'd been Caliph, the inscription would have said Amir or Mu'minin or, 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 or Caliph or whatever. And as I just even buildings and, and, and monuments that people have visited millions of times and tourists have visited, you know, in, in loads and loads, still suddenly new things come up. And to get that identification of building with builder is, 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 is very interesting. Walid II made a lot of enemies uh, quite quickly when he became caliph because of his lifestyle and because people were generally dissatisfied with him. And he ends up by being murdered in a palace whose ruins still survive uh, just south of Palmyra, just south of Tadmora in the Syrian desert uh, by, as his enemies come. And like Uthman, uh, he is portrayed, rightly or wrongly, as being killed while he sits in his palace reading Quran for all that his reputation for uh, wild living. This is, this is how he, he ended up. Excuse me. Now, Islamic history, um, the Umayyad period and later, if it tells us one lesson that Muslims might have contemplated afterward, it's that the murder of caliphs leads to trouble. It does not solve problems. It creates a whole raft of new ones. And the death of Walid II, far from solving the problem of having a, a wayward ruler, actually unleashed a whole lot of... Um, problems. And what essentially happened was that the Umayyad ruling class broke into two different groups, or rather two different groups that had been there for some time um, actually now m moved into open hostility. And these two groups uh, are known in the Arabic sources as uh, Qaisis, Cases, case and case and Yemen. I'll just call them case and Yemen. Now, these uh, groups were essentially political parties. Not they particulars we can, as far as we can work out, different ideologies, but they were different political parties within the, within the ruling group. But because of the way that the Arabs at that time thought of politics, they present themselves as if they were tribal groups. 
they were tribal confederations. But the, the, it, it seems to be a lot more complicated than that. And what the basis of it is, is not clear. Uh, it seems to me and not, uh, that the Yemen were essentially those uh, Syrian Arab tribes which had lived in Syria and on the borders of Syria before the Islamic conquests. Uh, many of them had been originally Christian. By this time, they were probably all converted to Islam, or the vast majority of them were converted to Islam, whereas the Qaisis were people who'd come up with Quraysh at the time of the Muslim conquest. And there seems to have been a residual friction between, as you imagine, those Arabs who'd lived there forever and those Arabs who'd coming into the area. And all sorts of problems you could all too easily imagine about whose grazing was where and, and, and you know, dispute for resources and so on. What happens with the death of Walid II is what had been um, a political uh, rivalry and economic rivalry and so on. Uh, um, spreads into open warfare. And different caliphs come and go very quickly. I haven't, for some reason, written on this little list the name of the last Umayyad caliph, Marwan II. But the Umayyad elite divides amongst itself. And there are frequent battles between members of the Umayyad elite. And as a result of that, it gives the enemies of the Umayyads the opportunity that they haven't had before. And the uh, members of the Umayyad elite are prepared to cooperate with anti-Umayyad elements against other members of the Umayyad elite. It's a classic example of a political system that destroys itself, really, from within. And there may have been financial economic problems <laughs> and so on that, that went along with it. So where does the opposition come from? Well, you'll have guessed from what I've been saying all the way through that a lot of the opposition comes from Iraq. The people of Iraq, now they, they don't get their share of the pay. The Syrians have been dominating them. They're not getting their, their, their salaries anymore. Uh, they're very much a subject, second-class citizen population. But as always, again, in early Islamic, this period of the Umayyad period, the Iraqis are divided, the Ahl al-Iraq are divided amongst each other. They can't present a united front. There are those who support the old tribal leaders. They, they are, are st still around. There are those who are looking for a Sunni, uh, sorry, a Shi'i, or at least a, um, an allied uh, candidate. And they're thoroughly disorganized. And the Syrian army in, in, in Wasit is basically strong enough to keep them under control, <coughs> even though the political leadership is divided and so on that the Syrians in Wasit are strong enough to keep them under control. The overthrow of the Umayyads is not going to come from Iraq, despite the overwhelming hostility of the Ahl al-Iraq to uh, the Umayyads. It's coming from much further east. The Abbasid family, uh, descendants of the Prophet's uncle, al-Abbasid and Abdul Muttalib, uh, had been living in Syria. Uh, they were a sort of part of the Umayyad establishment, actually that we think of them as bitter enemies. They were uh, comparatively prosperous. They attended the courts of the Umayyad caliphs. They you know, did that sort of thing. And for a long time, they seem to have no political ambition. And interesting enough, this is another, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just falling over a wire here, but that's um, another um, piece of archeological evidence that has come into the equation is about 15 years ago now, there were excavations um, at a place called Humayma. Now, Humayma is in southern Jordan on the road to Aqaba. And it's been known as a site for a long time. It's also said that the Abbasid family lived in Humayma before the Abbasid revolution, before they became caliphs. That's where they lived. And there are stories about how they cultivated olives there and so on and so forth. But interestingly, uh, this it's more a country house than a palace. It's not really terribly grand. There's a little mosque outside it and so on. The pictures, in fact, in my book on the, um, on the courts of the caliphs of it. Um, it's, excavation has made it clear that this is the, the place where the Abbasid family lived before they became caliphs. It was abandoned. Well, after they became caliphs, of course, they went to live in Iraq and Baghdad and so on. And it was abandoned and it became a ruin. And it was an unknown ruin, really, until um, uh, Jordanian and, in fact, um, 
British archaeologists started to excavate it quite recently, and it shows the, you know, the, their lifestyle. It's quite a, a luxurious, comfortable house in the sense it's got some ornamentation, a little bit of painting, bits, fragments of what was obviously quite posh furniture and so on and so forth. But it wasn't a grand palace at all, but they, they were well off. Um, now, what happened was, or we don't know exactly because the whole mythology developed about that, but it's clear that around the year 100 of the Hijri, around uh, 720 of the Common Era, that disaffected Muslims in Khorasan, in the far northeast, Khorasan is, a, is a, partly in Iran but partly beyond the Iranian frontier in what used to be Soviet Central Asia, uh, were looking for a candidate to put up against the Umayyads, so to speak. Not this was an election, this was going to be a, a violent confrontation for sure. And in ways that we don't un quite understand, a contact was made between the Abbasid family in Khomeima and the Khorasanis. And members of the Abbasid family started to send dais, a dai, of course, a missionary, a caller, um, to Khorasan. And they sent, amongst other people, or they emerged amongst other people, as I say, a lot of mythology, a lot of contradictory stories here, a man called Abu Muslim. Um, and Abu Muslim became the Abbasid. Um, family's manager, if you like, political agent in Khorasan. And he began to gather the people of Khorasan uh, in a military force against the Umayyads. Uh, the Umayyad people in Khorasan certainly fought back, but the momentum was um, irresistible. So what, was the, what were the Umayyads, what were these du'at, these, these missionaries calling for in Khorasan? Well, it was all quite cleverly done. They really had two things. They proclaimed that they wanted not an Abbasid, the name Abbasid doesn't seem to have, or Ban al-Abbas doesn't seem to have come in their propaganda at all. They wanted Radam in Ali Muhammad, a chosen one from the family of the Prophet. Nicely vague. It's a catch-all phrase. Anybody with uh, uh, Shi or Ahl uh, uh sympathies can, can relate to it. And they never specified a name of who they can do for the caliph and being, what they said is, we overthrow the Umayyads, we'll find a member of the house of, a chosen one from the house of the Prophet. And so, as a result, lots and lots of people, not only in Khorasan, but later in Iraq, were prepared to join in this, because most people, particularly in Iraq, must have assumed that it was going to be one of the Alid family, was going to be the new, new leader. But the Abbasids also promised something else, because Khorasan was an area where, on the frontiers, a lot of Arab Muslims had settled. They didn't settle so much in Western Iran and so on, which was well within the um, Dar al-Islam. They tended to go to the frontiers because that's where they were sent as soldiers, that's where the action was and so on. So conversion to Islam was much quicker, strangely enough, in the northeastern frontiers of the Islamic world than it was in places much more, more so inside the Islamic world uh, the, 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 because of, of all this settlement. So you get a whole population of um, Muslims um, who non-Arab Muslims in Khorasan. It was one of the places where the conversion to Islam was uh, much quicker. You got a lot of non-Arab Muslims in, in, in Khorasan. You also got a lot more intermarriage, I think, between people who are of Arab descent and people who are of local Khorasani, Iranian descent and so on. So you get a whole lot of Ahl Khorasan who are not part of the Arab elite, but are Muslims. And what of something that the Abbasid propaganda, well, what Abu Muslim's propaganda, which was in fact Abbasid propaganda, so to speak, in disguise, emphasized was that the difference between Arabs and non-Arabs would disappear. 
They were all Muslims from Khorasan. It didn't matter whether you came from the poshest Arab tribe imaginable, from Quraysh or Tamim or whatever, or whether you just came from a native Iranian origin, were all Muslims of Khorasan together. It broke down the barriers and prejudice between Arabs and non-Arabs and created a, as I say, a Muslim army and a Muslim movement. And that was perhaps its real strength because anybody from whatever background could join in this uh, Abu Muslim's army. And so they, with this really mass support, they came west, they defeated the Umayyads, uh, in the end uh, killing the last Umayyad caliph, uh, Marwan II, in Egypt, and setting up the new regime. And once they'd conquered, lo and behold, the man who stood up in the mosque in Kufa and gave the first sermon, the first khutbah of the, well, it wasn't the khutbah, because it was, he was, the was, uh, first um, sermon of the new regime turned out to be Abu Abbas al Safar, not an, not an Alid at all, but a member of the Abbasid family. And when people objected to this, uh, firstly, Abu Muslim sent his agents to dispose of them in a very brutal way. And the Abbasid Caliphate was born in this almost sort of accidental way. Well, it wasn't accidental, it was very carefully planned. But just like the Umayyads, as final thought perhaps, the Abbasids came in with a difficult legitimacy problem. Because the lot of people who had supported the revolution that brought the Abbasids to power had actually thought they were supporting somebody else a member of the Alid family and so on. So just like the Umayyads, the Abbasid Caliphate begins with, as I say, a legitimacy problem. What I want to, to the point I want to make, I think, is that in many ways the, uh, um, the Umayyads can be considered as the founders of Islamic architecture. And what went on in Umayyad rule, under Umayyad rule, no, I'm just going to search a bit. Um, during this period, essentially, uh, just, I'm, I am so sorry, I should have, you know, should be much better at doing these things than I am. Um, what, I, uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that um, what, if we're asking the question uh, that I, I so slightly jokingly put before, uh, what did the Umayyads do for us, then one of the things is that Umayyad began um, Islamic architecture, and they began it in such a, a spectacular way that what went on under Umayyad rule in, 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 um, in, in, in Jerusalem and Damascus had a profound effect on the development of Islamic architecture. Uh, in subsequent years. Now, of course, the, uh, the question of the origins of the mosque and of Islamic architecture is, is, is naturally quite controversial. And we know that there were mosques before the Dome of the Rock, and the Dome of the Rock is, 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 is a wonderful building, uh, partly because it's extremely beautiful and elegant, but partly because of its historicity and its historical context. We know, various, we know um, as certainly as we can ever know anything like this, when it was built, who it was built by, and to an extent why it was built, and all these things I shall talk about. But it, the, the date is around the year 690. So we've got, um, what, 60, 70 years since the, between the death of the Prophet and the first standing Islamic monument. And people have been puzzled by this and uh, trying to work out why this long gap. But I don't think we need to be, uh, this isn't a, a major problem. I think the, the early uh, build buildings that the Muslims put up, the early mosques and enclosures and so on, as described in, um, in Sirah and Hadith and so on, but also in the early, written, uh, early historical sources, uh, the first buildings were very simple. We have literary descriptions, I textual descriptions, the early mosques at Kufa and Basra. It is possible 
that we have archaeological evidence of the first mosque in Basra as well. Uh, that, that's not, um, uh, needs more investigation to be certain about that. And what we can be certain about, what we, we think is that these early mosques were simple enclosures built of mud brick. Probably mud brick is the, the, the key building um, material, of course, of, of uh, the eastern half of the Islamic world. And the earliest mosques which are described are indeed in the eastern part of the Islamic world in Basra and Kufa and so on. So we'd expect them to be built of mud brick. Now, mud brick is, a, is an excellent material in sorts of ways for building. It's, it's cheap and easy uh, to construct. Uh, it's also got extremely good insulating pro, uh, um, qualities. I mean, it keeps things cool in the summer and, and, and warm in the winter and so on. But inevitably, its shelf life is quite limited. And in particular, um, if it's not protected by a roof and so on, then it simply dissolves. Uh, under, under the rain, and when it dissolves, then uh, it simply becomes heaps of mud. And uh, it's very difficult to distinguish archaeologically uh, what's going on here. And so the sort of materials that the earliest mosques were built of were very uh, fragile or very temporary, if you know what I mean. And the decoration, insofar as we know anything about it, was either in wood or in stucco. And stucco is uh, uh, a plaster work, uh, a plaster surface put on a mud brick wall or a not very beautiful wall and then carved when it's about as, um, about as hard as butter is when it comes out of the fridge, i.e. you can make a shape in it and it will keep the shape, except that rather than putting it back in the fridge, you, you dry it and then you can paint over it with um, uh, thin layers of plaster and so on. And the point here is that the stucco work um, pr could provide beautiful decoration, but again, it's very sensitive to, to weather. If it gets damp and so on, then it, then it simply dissolves. And um, stucco work, mud brick or um, brick and stucco work were characteristic of Sasanian building in the pre-Islamic period. And we must imagine that uh, when the early Muslims settled in, in Iraq, then they took on the technologies of building that were already around, and they probably took on lots of the workmen that were already around. So the fact that these buildings um, don't survive and, and should not surprise us. I mean, that's, it's completely natural. We don't have to have some elaborate idea that they didn't build buildings or whatever, whatever, <laughs> or, or, you know, they, they clearly did. They're described, as I say, in the, um, in the literature. Um, and so it's not until we come to the Umayyad uh, rule in uh, Syria that we start to get permanent buildings because in Syria things are very different in terms of materials. Uh, the building materials of Syria are stone. The two important varieties of stone and no doubt many others but one is the white limestone or whitish limestone typical of Syria and, and Palestine. And the other is the black basalt uh, that occurs naturally on the surface in, in many areas in eastern Syria, eastern Jordan, and so on and so forth. So you've got these two kinds of stone. But it wasn't just the, uh, the fact there was loads of stone around. Whereas in Iraq and southern Mesopotamia, there is virtually no building stone at all. In Syria, there's tons of it, and a lot of it very good. But also, they inherited a tradition of building in stone, whereas in Mesopotamia, in, in Iraq, from the Sasanians, they inherited a tradition of, I say, mud brick and plaster building. In the Western Islamic world, they inherited a tradition of stone building, um, a stone building tradition that went right back to Roman times with tall round columns, arches, uh, and uh, finely carved. Uh, things, uh, finely carved ornamentation, and, and also traditions of decoration, of which the most in, conspicuous and, 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 and fabulous is the use of glass wall mosaics, uh, which was developed in, in late Roman Byzantine times and was still very much alive at the time of the Umayyads, as we shall see. So the fact that the earliest Islamic architect survives in, in Syria uh, rather than in Iraq, or indeed in Iran or anywhere else, 
is, I think, largely a function not of the fact that it was the, it was the first and there wasn't any others, but largely a function of the materials that were used and the fact that it's much more permanent and so on. And the two buildings I want to um, go on about today are, as you might have guessed, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem and the um, uh, and the, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. Let's start with the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. I don't know whether this will give me a pointer or, or not. Yes, it does. Good. Uh, this is the, uh, the old city of Jerusalem, an aerial photograph taken uh, in the late 1960s, beginning of the 1970s. You see the walls of the city of Jerusalem here, of the old city of Jerusalem going down there to uh, Mount Zion and along there. That represents the old city. And the uh, area of the old city contains two major um, cultic sites, if you like. I don't mean that in any d d disparaging sense. Um, there is the cultic site that is represented by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in this area here. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, of course, the main Christian shrine developed from the beginning of the fourth century onwards, the site where Christians believe uh, that Christ was both crucified and rose again from the dead. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, has always been um, a major monument in Christian worship, though architecturally, I must say, it's, it's a bit of a mess. And then this site here, what uh, Muslims know as the Haram al-Sharif, the Haram al-Sharif is, of course, the uh, platform on which the Herodian temple was built, i.e. it dates from the late uh, first century BC, say 20th or 30th century BC. The site was destroyed and laid waste by the Romans, and the temple was pulled down by the Romans in the year 70. And we don't know what went on on this platform between the destruction of the old uh, Jewish temple and the coming of Muslim buildings on, on, the, dome of the, uh, on, on the site of the Haram al-Sharif. The Haram al-Sharif um, acquires its own reputation for sanctity in the Umayyad period. The idea particularly this was the place from which the Prophet Muhammad descended into heaven uh, at the time of the Miraj, the, the voyage to the journey to see the heavens. And there is, of course, that old tradition that the original Qibla of the Muslim community, uh, uh, traditions reflected in Hadith and other early um, that the um, basic, uh, uh, that the original Qibla was indeed the, um, let's look at, uh, what, what, what was indeed Jerusalem, not Mecca. So there is a long tradition of the Islamic sanctity of, of, of Jerusalem. Here we see a view from the side again, uh, taken some time ago, there's lots more, as we all know, it's, for whatever reason, lots of more building here now. But here we see the Dome of the Rock at the summit of the rock there, and the other main building on the uh, um, Haram al-Sharif, the Aqsa Mosque. Let me see what else I can do. Um, and here it is. Oh. All right, okay. Here we are again from the south, looking at the Aqsa Mosque. Sorry, for whatever reason, the, the colors are curiously um, faded here. Uh, it's the Mount of Olives, which is in this photograph, still sort of open country almost, on, on the top right there. And uh, the Aqsa Mosque in the foreground. And here, in the area in front of the old walls here, that has been excavated in uh, the late 60s, beginning of the 70s, an Umayyad palace. Just as where you'd expect a palace to be, up against the south, the Qibla wall of the, um, I mean, oh, we've got a different presentation here. It's all very exciting, this, and a bit, and a bit unpredictable. Um, but, um, but actually, this is a rather helpful way of looking at it. Here is the south wall of the, um, the Haram, and there uh, is the Dome of the Aqsa Mosque. And here is the, what we must think of as the Governor's Palace of, sort of, of Umayyad Jerusalem. Um, excavated, not, not it must be said, very well published, but excavated, revealing a, um, 
Umar Jerusalem is, is, was a political center as well as a religious one. But it's clearly the religious architecture. Oh. Um, what happens here? Oh, this is better. Um, and uh, there's a lot of the, the dome of the rock. But let's have another look here at um, the Here's another view showing the relationship between these two buildings. Now, the Dome of the Rock, the exterior of the Dome of the Rock was um, decorated with uh, tiles under the um, reign of Suleiman, the magnificent Suleiman Kanuni, uh, in the 16th century. So the exterior, but the basic architectural form and function of this building is uh, dates from the reign of Abdul Malik. The Aqsa Mosque has had a much more difficult history. Uh, the uh, basic form of it is certainly dates from the Umayyad period, but at various stages it's been altered and it's been um, uh, reduced in width. The dome was put on in, in the Fatimid period, I, uh, uh, in the 990s, 200 years after the original uh, construction. Uh, but the basic outline remains the same. Let me see what I can do here uh, in terms of general views. Uh, the outside of the, of, of the Dome of the Rock there with the 16th century tiles. But let's um, see if we can go inside here. And it's a, because it's an octagonal building, around a center. It's actually very difficult to photograph in, in, an, in, in an intelligent way. But let's have a look at this uh, aerial photograph of the interior here. And this is the rock uh, from which the Prophet Muhammad is supposed to have ascended. And it was a, a rock which seems to have been the center of the old Jewish temple as well. And round it, there are circular arcades and arches with pillars here all the way around. You can actually, as, as many of you must know, you can go down these stairs underneath the rock. Or oh, well, you could <coughs> when visiting was easier. Let's see what else I can, I can do. As I say, these photographs are not the most brilliant photographs in the entire world, but I do want to talk about uh, what's going on here. And once again, uh, the color is, is not as good as it should be. But um, what I want to talk about particularly is, is to look at the architecture here. And especially, uh, we have the pillars, which are probably reused Roman pillars here, but chosen for the excellence of their marble around the corner there. In the outer um, ambulatory, we have the arch, the pillars, the piers here. Piers are basically square supports and pillars are basically round supports. But the piers here are clad in marble coverings, thin sheets of marble chosen for their decorative quality put up against the walls there. And we can see the arches around here, yeah? Uh, the arches around here are alternately what's technically known as the voussoirs, that's the sections of the arches that go around, are alternative of made of white limestone and black basalt. So you get this very characteristic, what the Arabs call ablak, um, uh, which is the sort of way you describe a horse, which is partly black and partly white, piebald in English. Um, you get this, this alternating thing here. And then, and I'll show you a bit more, inshallah, of, I think I've got a photograph, of the gold mosaic up there. And the dome itself, the actual wooden dome itself, seems to be quite modern and doesn't have any ancient decoration on it. So what are we looking at here and why? We're looking, firstly, at obviously a very high status building. This is decorated with expensive materials very carefully put together. And all the materials, in, in a sense, have their own color, their own intrinsic, um, yes, their own intrinsic color, their own, um, that's say you, you're, you're not dealing with painting or bits of plaster. You're dealing with solid materials. You're dealing with solid marble panels. You're dealing with glass mosaics and so on. With the result that the colors of these things don't basically fade or alter through the centuries. I mean, these, these pillars are still the same, got the same marble patterns as they had when they were put up. 
And we're looking here at a building that is very much in the Byzantine tradition. All the elements of decoration, with the possible exception of the, ablak, the black and white uh, parallels there, relate to Byzantine work, um, you know, most famously, of course, Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, but lots of Byzantine churches. But this is Byzantine technology reused for an Islamic purpose. This is not a church. It's never been a church. It's not got the same plans as a church. It is designed uh, to be an Islamic building using the sort of the technologies of the defeated Byzantine regime. And it must be said that it's of a much higher standard, more elegant standard than any Byzantine building of its, of, it, of its period. So it somehow, in a way, encapsulates what's going on in, in, in the Umayyad period, just as we've seen um, old taxation systems are reused for an Islamic purpose and things like milestones, the ideas of it reused for an Islamic purpose. So we've got the archi architectural technologies reused for a, a new Islamic purpose. But what is this purpose? This is not a mosque in any conventional sense of the word. It has no mihrab. It is, in a sense, its own, it's its own kibbler in a sort of way. And it looks from the architecture as if it's clearly designed for tawaf, uh, because you have these, these galleries that go round here and so on. It's not designed for classic Muslim worship with lines of worshippers in the direction of the qibla. Um, that doesn't make sense in terms of the Aqsa Mosque, for sure. The Aqsa Mosque is, it has exactly that, and I'm not uh, going to go inside the Aqsa. So, um, so what's going on here? What sort of building is this? Um, now, there is an old Islamic tradition uh, dates back at least to the works of Al Yaqubi, writing in the ninth century, that the background to the construction of the Dome of the Rock is that this was a period when the Haramain, Mecca and Medina, particularly in this context, Mecca, were in the hands of Ibn Zubair. And therefore, um, the uh, Umayyad Caliph um, Abdul Malik, who had just come to the throne, was extremely anxious that his followers should not be obliged to go on the Hajj to the Haramain, which were controlled by his political enemy. And so he, it's possible that he devised an alternative Hajj center in Jerusalem, which, as I was explaining before, has this uh, Muslim, um, um, uh, has this uh, charisma in Islam, this is prestige in Islam. Now this, as I say, is a, is a tradition that goes way back in the Arab sources. We don't need to imagine, I think, that Abdul Malik was suggesting that the Kaaba and, 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 and Mecca should be replaced on any sort of permanent basis. I think he was trying to create another, while, you know, until Mecca and Medina were, were reconquered or brought back under a mild rule, he was maybe trying to choose and uh, find an alternative holy site which his, um, uh, which his followers could could visit and perform the tawaf and, and possibly the rites of pilgrimage. Now, this is, uh, this is by no means clear, it's a, the, the source is much later, but it does go some way to explaining the uh, form of the building. Let's see if I can find um, any more nice, interesting photographs. Let's look here. This is, gives you some idea again of the decoration of the ablak pillars here. And you can see up there some of the mosaic work. Now, the mosaic works of the, of the Dome of the Rock are, um, of course, there are no living creatures in, 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 oh, no, that's not true. There are living things, but they're all plants. There are no, um, uh, ana there are no people and there are no animals, as there would have been in a Byzantine uh, context. But you can see the black and white uh, things there and the mosaics there um, and the I think one of the fascinating things if we look around what the, the spandrels of the arches here what we see is exactly because they're all made of marble and stone it's exactly what we see not just the form but the color of what we saw at the beginning of uh, what they would have seen in um, in the Umayyad period and in the time of Abdul Malik I just wonder whether I've got um, 
Yeah. When we see the mosaics, these, this is what we see. They're beautifully done, they're technically extremely competent, and we get the, these sort of vases with their handles and growing out of them a sort of tree of life, or what look like sort of giant cactuses really, but uh, the, these plants, so we've got plants growing out of urns and vases and so on, reflecting um, the luxury perhaps of the production. And so I think the Dome of the Rock, which miraculously has survived for 1,500 years, almost completely in the form that it was built, gives us a really clear indication of the wealth of the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, but also the determination of Abdul Malik in particular to create an Islamic monument which would be as good or better than any of the Christian churches, which were still very prominent, and still are today in a way, a very prominent feature of the Palestinian landscape. It's a deliberate statement in the inscription that I've already talked about, the inscription that, uh, that um, uh, uh, this very um, monotheistic inscription, but also in the splendor of the building. And it possibly is no accident that the size of the dome of the Dome of the Rock is just that little bit bigger than the uh, size of the dome of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the two buildings, as it were, confront each other across the uh, central, uh, uh, central valley of the old city of Jerusalem there. They're almost like having a debate. And, and certainly uh, Abdul Malik's building is bigger and more the Muslim building is bigger and more impressive than its Christian counterpart. I think we should see this as a very uh, is, is, is Islamic statement here. And uh, it, as I say, it's the oldest standing building of Islamic architecture and still to, to this day one of the most magnificent. So let's look now to the uh, I'll have to get more beady with this technology and so on. But uh, let's look where we came in to the um, Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. And when you come in to the um, uh, great courtyard there, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus was built on the site of, of a very ancient holy place. It seems to have been, Damascus has been inhabited for millennia. And it's probable that this was the site of the first temple of the, the Semitic god Hadad. Um, it then becomes a Roman temple. It then becomes a Christian cathedral in the name of Saint, uh, dedicated St. John. And then we're told that after the uh, Muslim <coughs> conquest that the holy precinct, if you like, the holy enclosure uh, was divided between Christians and Muslims. Uh, and it's not until the reign of uh, Abdul Malik's son Al-Walid uh, from 705 to 715 that the whole of the area is taken over by the Muslims. And there is a whole discussion in the sources about how this was done, how the, uh, uh, the, the Caliph Abdul Malik tried to um, uh, persuade the Christians to leave or persuade the Christians to sell it to them and they all refused and then his son Al-Walid was more determined, and um, he allowed the, the Christians, or uh, obliged the Christians to move to the uh, Church of St. Mary, which is very close and which still remains the center of Melkite Christianity uh, down to the present day, and that's uh, Greek Orthodox Christianity, Greek Orthodox Arabic-speaking Christianity, so to speak, uh, in, um, in, in, in the center of Damascus, uh, the church itself is is much newer. Let's look around a little bit, a little bit around the courtyard here, uh, with these uh, combination of pillars and arches, with the two extra pillars and arches here, and here above them. This wing, this it, this wing, is purely Umayyad. This is exactly the building that Al Walid built. This has been altered in various ways, but that wing is completely. Um, as, as, as we see at the time. Uh, let's see a bit more here. There again, this is one of the gates. 
uh, with again the uh, the arches with two little arches above, and you can just see in in, in the spandrels that's this bit of the arch here. You can see some of the mosaic work, which I'm going to say a bit more about later on. Um, yep, yep, yep. Now I'm looking for. Um, this is a view uh, taken of the, I suppose, the Eastern Gate. And I take this view, and it's, it's, it's the um, cover photograph, or one very like it is the cover photograph of the book of the, my book of the Prophets in the Age of the Caliphates. And because this is one of the areas of the mosque where the original decoration survives. You've not just got the pillars and the, and the arches and so on. And you can see how the use of marble panels here these are all, this is, it looks as if this might be painted decoration, it isn't at all. It's all marble cut very thin and put on the, the, on the stonework. And here we can see the, as it were, the magnificence of Umayyad architecture. And the, the richer, the scale of it, the rich effects that they were striving for. The Dome of the Rock, um, sorry, the mosque, uh, the Umayyad mosque in Damascus is certainly the biggest and most important architectural monument of the Mediterranean world in the 8th century. There's nothing anywhere else, not, you know, not in Rome, not in Constantinople, not in Cordoba, from this period that compares in, in the sense that there's the scale and the uh, fineness of the building and decoration. Nothing else that compares with the, uh, uh, with the uh, mosque in Damascus, and I'm looking for, and so I'm sorry not to be more adept at these things. Uh, what we got here, oh, we've already, sorry, we've already looked at that. Um, oh, damn it, I've lost it now. Um, sorry, I've gone back one too far, haven't I? C can we get back on her? Right. Uh, yeah, and then we go down to um, um, Umayyad, Jerusalem, Damascus. Yes, so I wonder if we can display these as images. Yes, perfect. Large icons are just perfect. Uh, let me try to lead you inside here. Now this is interior looking down inside the um, Great Mosque in Damascus. And it is the most stupendous um, interior in 8th century building anywhere, except that it isn't quite. For the, Umad, the prayer hall of the mosque was burnt out in an accidental fire in 1893. It probably wasn't the first fire, um, but Unfortunately, at that stage, the um, Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, wanted to make a grand gesture. And instead of repairing what was there with, uh, and, and using the old pillars and so on to create a new mosque, uh, the Ottoman government decided to sweep it all away and build a mosque on the same scale and the same plan, but with entirely new materials. So what this photograph shows you, while it shows you the grandeur and the overall planning of the building, the actual fabric that you're seeing uh, dates from the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, there are existing photographs of both the, the interior um, before the fire and the uh, interior immediately after the fire, which reveal uh, what it looked like. But uh, this photograph is still important and interesting um, because, as I say, it gives you some idea of the scale of the ambition of the uh, Umayyad building here. And you see this funny little structure with the dome, which you can see sort of partly that. This is a sanctuary that uh, claims to contain the head of St. John the Baptist, which, when you think about it, seems slightly contraindicated um, in, in the middle of the mosque here, but it reflects the continuities that we find between late antique Christianity in, in, in some way. The cathedral that stood on this site before contained a shrine to St. John the Baptist. It was dedicated to a St. John. 
What is clear, though, the building, the actual dome building, which you can't really see, is late 19th century along with the rest of it. It clearly perpetuates the memory of the way John the Baptist, of course, as the predecessor of Jesus, has a certain um, uh, holy status within at least some Islamic traditions. And it's clear that the early Muslims preserved the memory of this holy place and in some way the cult of this, this, this holy place in, uh, in their own uh, time. Um, now I want to move on from the uh, uh, from the interior here to the mosaics that survive not in the interior of the building but around the courtyard and you can see here for example uh, on one of the outside arches the uh, um, the, the mosaics of these trees and so on up there um, on the outside oh, damn it. Wish it. sorry um, I'm going to have to ask you to get back I'm so sorry Ms. I'm not um, I really want to get back to the images yeah this will this, this, do this will do Yes, yeah, yeah, I can, I can work from this. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, let's have a look at some more of these. More of these. This is uh, one of the arches here with an architectural decoration. Uh, the, oh, no. Um, Let's try large icons. Oh, miraculously. Um, <laughs> it's come back for me. When we get inside um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the cloister there, we find mosaic panels. And as I say, these are on the outside around the cloister, which have survived from a Maya period. And they're, they're very remarkable indeed. Um, they portray a fantasy landscape or a whole series of fantasy landscapes. Um, there is, at the bottom of this one, it doesn't quite show on this, but there is a river running by here. And there are these big trees, and these big trees frame what is clearly a village, some possibly modelled on some village in the Ghuta, the Garden of, of Damascus with the pointed uh, roofs and so on, and the trees behind. Uh, not very, uh, not grand architectural palaces or anything, but a village scene. Of course, there are no people inhabiting this village, but nonetheless, it, that's uh, clearly what it is. Some other panels, this is slightly damaged here, uh, portray much more elaborate architecture. It all looks like Greek and Roman architecture. It looks like classical architecture, which is what you expect, because the building itself looks like that. Um, but it, it's very complicated, and what's going on here is difficult always to tell. Uh, but it's got a bit like some of those who have been to Petra in Jordan will have seen great facades like this, particularly these little um, turrety bits in the corner here, and the whole f um, thing uh, framed in trees. Uh, let's see what others we can uh, come up with here. No, that's another view of the. Uh, of the um, village, oh, uh, what did it? I don't know how to get it to stop on large icons, but now we'll get there in the end and mullish because we hear more fantasy architecture and so on. Again, we've seen this little bits, but it's difficult to know what's going on here. If you look through the arch to this little building that's there and, and the trees and so on. So what, is, what on earth is going on here? What is this fantasy landscape? It's, and there have been a lot of interpretations, but I mean, I think the most obvious one is this is intended to be a paradise landscape. It's got the trees, the palaces, the rivers running through and so on. But it may not be as complicated as that. 
It may, or not as, as, or not as meaningful as that. It may just be a decoration, a beautiful thing to rest the eye on while you're in the courtyard of the mosque, while you're uh, preparing to pray or whatever, and you're surrounded by this vision of this, these green and wonderful gardens and so on. Whatever it is, it shows an extraordinary degree of, well, one of the most basic level financial investment, but also of an uh, extraordinary degree of technical competence in the mosaics. And again, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the Mediterranean world uh, of its period. It's much more refined, it's on a much larger scale, and it, it, it's much more imaginative. Now, there is an, a story uh, that again comes in, in the early Arab sources that the emperor of Constantinople sent mosaic artists to Damascus from Constantinople to work on these things. Um, it's not explained quite why this should have happened or why he should have done it, but it does look very much as if uh, this technique of glass mosaics, um, because the glass mosaics are not stone mosaics on the walls here, is a technique that was perfected in Constantinople. It was not one that was used in pre-Islamic Syria, or at least not very much where there are lots of stone mosaics on floors, but not these glass wall mosaics. So it looks as if um, the uh, Umar Khalif well, Walid uh, the first in this case, imported and probably recruited and paid for uh, mosaic craftsmen from, Damascus, from Constantinople to come to Damascus and create a specifically Islamic landscape and form of decoration. For if this had been in Constantinople, the walls would have had figures of the Virgin, figures of Christ, figures of the saints and the apostles and so on. It would have been fully populated by uh, human beings. Um, and yet, it, uh, uh, and this is a I said there are no human beings here at all. But what we're thinking, uh, what I'm thinking when I look at this, again, as in so many other ways, the Umayyads, Abdul Malik and Al-Walid are appropriating, taking over the uh, royal architecture and symbols of the Byzantine world and using them to create a new Islamic iconography, a new Islamic uh, s um, series of images, uh, and to create basically an Islamic caliphal style, an Islamic imperial style, if you like. And uh, there's a conscious decision, as so often, not to keep mosques, not just have mosques that are very simple mud brick things with simple decoration and so on, but to create something that's really grand and impressive and demonstrates for everyone who comes by the uh, triumph of Islam and the, the fact that this was a new religion, a new dominant religion that had come to stay and that its um, buildings and decorations were as grand and important and wonderful as anything that preceded it. I think it's a very clear statement, a very clear claim here uh, to establish an Islamic um, high art repertoire. If you mean, let's see whether there are uh, any other bits of, of decoration we should know. I don't think. Um, I think we, 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 we've seen most of these. I think that's uh, that's another one of these visions of architecture. And so, what I've uh, done in this uh, this time this afternoon is is, is to try to show how um, the physical architectural remains make the same sort of points as what we're talking about the administration uh, and the, the the use of writing and so on. The way in which, particularly Abdul Malik and Al Walid, um, were determined to establish this caliphal government, this new Islamic government, as a replacement for and something that was just as grand and impressive as any of the regimes that have preceded it, except, of course, with the obvious thing that it was now dedicated to the new and true religion of Islam rather than to the pagan religions that supported it. And if there's uh, the, the previous, that what came before it. And if there's one thing, a uh, common feature, I think, of, of, of 
that was one thing that we should remember about the, um, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate is how much of the establishment of Islamic political structures, Islamic and Arabic writing, and Islamic architecture and so on ultimately goes back to the Umayyads. And there is a, a sense in which uh, pretty much um, all the mosques that were built in southern, subsequent centuries, for example, uh, look back to the mosques of Damascus and um, uh, uh, and um, the Dome of the Rock. And if you go to the mosque in Cordoba, in, uh, uh, built, of course, by another branch of the Umayyad family uh, during the first three or four centuries of Islam, you will see the mosque in the interior in the mosque in Cordoba. These, around the tops of the arches, there are these ablak, um, these little, the, these voussoirs have these, uh, what is in, in Cordoba mostly red brick and white um, alternate arches. And this is clearly interpreted in local materials, a clear echo of the arches of the Dome of the Rock, right the way at the other end of the Mediterranean. And from the mosque in Cordoba, because it's, it, it's the building that it is, these sorts of decorative techniques pass to mosques in North Africa, to other parts of Spain, and so on. Umayyad style, again, spreading throughout the Mediterranean area. And I think that's something that is an, an important part of their achievement. So I'm going to finish there, but I hope that what I've been saying today has, in a sense, given you a rough outline of the um, Umayyad Caliphate, its history and its, um, and its, its eventual collapse. But I also hope that it's given you um, some idea of the impact of the Umayyad dynasty and its policies on much wider areas of uh, the development of Islamic culture and Islamic government and so on. And if different decisions had been made at different times, uh, then things might, by the Umayyad rulers, then things might have turned out very differently. As it was, they established Islamic government and Islamic architectural style and so on in a way that was to dominate for centuries to come. And that's a good reason for looking at them. Thank you very much.